Well, good evening. Um, apologies for us starting a little late. Uh, we had a work session and we always, always kind of runs right to the last minute. So welcome to the November 28th Planning Commission meeting. And would you like to call order? Commissioner Miranda. Here. Commissioner Lee. Here. Commissioner Thorson. Commissioner Strauss. Here. Commissioner Mangalik. Here. Commissioner Melton. Here. Commissioner Nemirov. Here. Commissioner Hamilton. Here. Commissioner Bennett. Here. Commissioner Berube. Here. Chair Olson. Here. Thank you. Um, next, we have the approval of the meeting agenda. Were there any amendments or adjustments to the agenda? Or is there a motion to approve? I move approval to have the agenda as submitted. Is there a second? Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next on the agenda is approval of the meeting minutes from the Planning Commission of the November 14th Planning Commission meeting. Were there any um, adjustments to that? The meeting minutes, edits, comments. I move approval of the minutes as submitted. Sure. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. So we're jumping right in. Are you guys ready? Are we moving too fast? A little technical issue. Pardon? Yeah, we should. So while we're doing that, one of the things on the agenda is a community comment, and we might flip it while and allow people to do that. So the community comment allows people from the uh, community to come up and speak on an item that won't be on the agenda tonight, and you won't necessarily have a, uh, your comment addressed tonight. But is there anybody who is here for community comment? And I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't. So move to. I move to close public <laughs> comment. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So that. So everyone's here for the 70th and Cahill? Is that? <laughs> So again, just if anyone's watching or just joining us, the, we have one public hearing meeting tonight. It's the 70th and Cahill Small Area Plan. And we're having a little technical difficulties. Do we have an alternative to, okay. Good evening. Fellow planning commissioners, um, I'm Susan Lee, and with my co-chair Jerry Strauss, we were the co-chairs for the 70th and Cahill Small Area Plan work group. Um, as you know, this is one of four small area plans that were well, actually small four small areas that were identified as potential areas of change back in the 2008 comprehensive plan. So although this is a small area plan, it is also being done in conjunction with the 2018 comprehensive plan update. We initially started about a year ago, I'd say actually more than a year ago, October of 2017, where we, uh, if you recall, we had the green print draft approved by the Planning Commission to form this work group. We proceeded to acquire the um, work group members, and we had our first meeting in the beginning of October of 2017. Uh, through that period and through to the holidays, it kind of pushed things back a little bit. So we finally had our first uh, kickoff meeting 
uh, just shortly before Christmas in December. We did have three, kick -off, uh, three public engagement meetings, uh, another one to follow in February, and then the uh, final one in March of 2018. Since that time, we had, uh, as a work group, fleshed out the vision and principles, and we also um, worked to plan the public engagement sessions, and then since that time have been writing the plan and editing it. So essentially for the last, uh, from late spring through early, early September, we have been writing um, and editing the draft. So the draft is out now, and you have a copy. It's out for public review. So I just wanted to hit some of the highlights. Within the comprehensive plan, there are designated uh, structure and chapters that are common to all cities. And our small area plan, like all small area plans, can choose which chapters that they would like to address as part of their small area plan. So we focused specifically on sort of five topical areas, the land use urban design, heritage pre preservation, economic vitality, the parks and open space, and transportation. Under the land use and urban design, uh, which is probably the most um, specified and specific prescript prescriptive portion of the plan, uh, it was to look at how to transform an existing commercial and industrial node to incorporate more housing and become more mi of a mixed use uh, center. The work group identified that other key elements should be to improve street level activity, have a space for community gathering, whether that's indoors or outdoors, provide a, a variety of housing options, and then there was the discussion of height and density. We received feedback during the many, uh, the three uh, public engagement sessions, as well as feedback from the work group that varied across the spectrum. So as you can imagine, we had uh, uh, individuals who were quite, quite satisfied with how things were, all the way up to very um, visionary people who, who saw multiple uh, major high-rise towers. So um, in the end, uh, we felt that as a work group, we reached a consensus that this area could support a maximum height of five stories. When it came to the density range, that only applies to residential construction or residential development. So if a parcel is going to remain 100% commercial or 100% re uh, retail, it wouldn't affect or be uh, bounded by the density range. Density range really re only comes into play when we're talking about multifamily housing, single family housing, and the whole spectrum. So that density range is um, recommended at 10 to a maximum of 50 dwelling units per acre. I'm just going to speak real quickly about heritage preservation. The thought here was that um, this area is unique in that it, it truly did have a history uh, component for the city of Edina. And in order to revitalize this area, the plan recommends that the historical aspects really be embraced and used to identify the area. So one of the things that the work group and then the plan reflects is this idea of Cahill Village. And the idea is that there were settler, the settlers who originally were in the area of the 1840s and 1850s are the ones who made this a sort of a center of commerce. Although it acts at this time more as a local area of retail and uh, uh, commerce for uh, surrounding neighborhoods, it still can be revived in terms of um, tapping into this historical preservation. Following along that, um, the work group and our consultant did a bit of an economic study surveying, surveying the business owners there and having a focus, holding a focus group with some area developers to talk about what could potentially spur development, what types of development did they see in this area. Uh, in addition, at the public engagement sessions, we asked or queried uh, participants as to what they'd like to see there. 
So out of that, some of the conclusions were that these current small and independent commercial businesses that are, are there now are very much appreciated and supported by the residents. And uh, there is a preference for that type of retail environment to continue as opposed to uh, more chain type, big box kind of uh, uh, businesses. That there should be a focus for the city to support this and find policies or ways to retain and attract small businesses. So again, it was keeping in with sort of this village concept. Um, in a recommendation from our, our consultant was that a clear business and property owner association would be really helpful in establishing a stronger base for supporting any kind of commercial or retail uh, future development that comes into this area. So. In order to garner the types of amenities that residents and even developers were saying that could be possible in this area, there was a, a recommendation that additional residential um, units in the study area would help to support that and diversify the base. So one way would be to think about having more um, greater height to uh, put apartment buildings above residential. Uh, the rents, therefore, then would sub subsidize some of the leases for more of the smaller and independent businesses. And as well, once those kinds of unique businesses were there, that in itself would expand the geographic scope of the market area as people who did hear about those things may be um, enticed to kind of come into and take advantage of those businesses. So expanding the, the uh, geographic area meant really giving a more of a uh, visual connection and signage wayfinding, improved linkages, so that people were aware of that location and that node. Parks and open space is not always addressed in every small area plan, but in this particular case, this location has the benefit of being right on the recently completed Nine Mile Creek bike trail. Uh, as well, Lewis Park is not too far from it, where many families uh, typically go take their kids for team sports. So the thought and the thinking of the plan is that the city must and should leverage this Nine Mile Creek Trail and use it as a drawing point to attract visitors and enhance biking and walking in, in the area. The thought and thinking is that by in doing so, it could become a stop along the bike trail, uh, a reason why people might actually come into uh, the commercial area to have a beer, have a drink, or uh, get something to eat before they continue on the path. In order to do that, it's going to require that there's an improved bike access and a pedestrian access along 70th Street right at Amundsen. Right now, the only way into the plaza for automobiles not, not quite safe enough because there's not a, a crossing for pedestrians and bikes, but for automobiles, they can make a turn into Amundsen. So it's at that intersection that um, heightened pedestrian and bike crossing would be proposed. Um, in addition, the city-owned property is directly below that uh, where the bridge crosses over the railroad tracks. The city-owned parcel could be integrated into a pocket park especially since the, uh, the bike trail actually travels right through it. So a suggestion was made to create a water feature and utilize that parcel as some portion of it for stormwater management. In addition, the area could support a new gathering or open space spot for residents and visitors. And it did, again, uh, to increase the wayfinding to the area as well as to the bike trail. The plan did not seek to design the area so much as to define it. And in order to define the area, it was felt that the existing Amundsen Street a road parallel to Cahill actually provides and sets up a, a grid-like network of interior streets. These interior streets seek to have localized traffic specific to just that study area. So in order to establish this grid system, um, 
the the design guidelines in the plan itself talk about uh, the various widths of the street, the interior street, and actually proposing a new uh, gateway, if you will, off Cahill Street um, near uh, down at the south end of the of the uh, study area. In addition, should a crossing be able to be made across the railroad tracks into the industrial park area, that is another recommendation in the plan in order to facilitate, again, greater connectivity and um, facilitate more uh, people. It could be a pedestrian, simply a pedestrian crossing or just a bike pedestrian crossing, not necessarily automobiles, or it could be for, for both. That wasn't quite fleshed out, but the sense was that is how we'd like to see that uh, grid work layout work. Uh, in addition, that there would be um, this, this uh, study area would be added to the shuttle transit route, linking the node to the rest of Edina, and as well to uh, for the city to work with um, Metro Transit to. Um, perhaps improve or increase the number of bus stops along Cahill and 70th. Specifics of the, the plan are that we incorporate a building heights limit plan, uh, a building types guidelines, and then we have site specific guidelines. These are all implement, implement uh, tools that the city can use when a uh, development comes forward. The building height plan is talking about a limit of three stories not to exceed 39 feet for buildings on the corner or north side of 70th Street. So it's the corner intersection of 70th and Cahill, right on the corner, three stories, and up to three stories um, on the southeast corner. The roof line of the buildings on the southeast corner from that point will establish the upper height not to exceed height limit for all buildings fronting on Cahill. As Cahill Sue. slopes down Sue. Sue. due to its topography. Sue, <laughs> sorry, just real. Can you use that like mouse or the hand and kind of? Sure. Thanks, that would be helpful when you're, okay. sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, as the topography slopes down Cahill, I'm sorry, this actually doesn't list the street. So this is Cahill, and this is 70th, and these are the railroad tracks. So this would be east, west, north, south. Is that right? Okay. All right, so as, it, as Cahill slopes down, here is where uh, the plan specifies that buildings may actually increase to up an upper limit of five stories so long as it's not taller than the three-story buildings up at the corner. That was the thinking. So in essence, on this street, the roof line would be the same, was the goal. Interior. So uh, these parcels here and along this Amundsen here, those parcels were actually shown as also possibly going up to an upper height limit of five stories. And if those are five stories, it would be a 63 foot height maximum. This plan is a little small, but that's what it's trying to delineate. Along Cahill, it would be bound by that requirement not to exceed the three story height right here at the corner. Interior to that, where the darker brown is, those parcels could potentially be anywhere from three to five stories in height. This gives just sort of a, uh, what I'd say is not a, uh, just, just an illustration. So if this is 70th here, Cahill slopes down, so we're kind of in a cross section looking uh, east. If this is a three-story building, all these buildings would not be any taller than what this building on the, on the corner. Is that five stories? It is five stories down here. It, it could even potentially, looks like here, potentially six stories and you would not exceed it. But right now the plan is saying five stories or not to exceed the upper height maximum established by the building 
at corner or the three story structures on 70th and K Hill. I think that one thing that uh, our work group spent a lot of time on was coming to uh, a consensus on what is it that we heard and taking into account all the different opinions which ran the, the range among our work group, uh, what, where was that comfort zone? And I'm confident that it is the five stories, anywhere from what it is currently now, because we did have people who said one story is fine, two stories fine. Currently it's zoned for two stories or 24 feet. That's the current zoning. So anywhere from that up to five stories, I'm confident, we're confident as co-chairs and the work group of saying that is, that's a consensus that we were able to, to arrive at. As far as the density, as we know, that's a difficult uh, topic. And our work group considered many, many projects. We looked at numbers, we looked at pictures, we looked at different projects outside the area. And I think what we learned from it is it, 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 they're all so different because one building could be setting, sitting on a one-acre parcel, another building same you know density or lower density but it's spread over three parcels so the density number didn't quite work for us in terms of identifying what is it that residents and stakeholders are concerned about most it really became height so although we have a density range of 10 to 50 I would say in in respect to what we looked at as a work group and considered it is probably more the height issue that is really going to, to, to be the, uh, the takeaway from this report. So I will answer any questions if there are at this point. Thank you very much, Susan. That was good. Um, so I'll open it up to the Planning Commission. Are there any um, questions for Susan or Jerry at this point? Okay. Commissioner Hamilton. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the stormwater pond and the piece that the city owns down there and why the decision came to make that, to retain that as open land and, and as stormwater mitigation for that point? I would, uh, first of all, it, lo it is situated in a low point for the area. So it already serves as, if you will, stormwater management. Um, it, it, that was actually a, an interesting concept to explain to our work group because many Visualized if we designated stormwater management, is it going to become this lake or puddle? Well, not any more so than it already is. And in fact, the bike trail routes right through there. So um, it is city property. There was a sense that uh, there is not any more green area to be had. It is currently green, if you will, quote unquote, that it would make, make a nice pocket park. So that was the extent of it. And also, as this area develops, that it could be uh, leveraged by the city as a way to say, we'll permit drainage to this area as a holding spot, if that will help you out to obtain the goals that we are seeking for our city. Commissioner Navarroff. Thanks. Hey, on the architectural study, is that something you're recommending to be done, like upon the conclusion of the comprehensive plan or upon the conclusion of the small area plan, or, or is that something that should be done? You, are you recommending that should be done uh, when a parcel is proposed for development? Oh, you're referring to the follow-up study. Uh, implement. This is an implementation step in about a follow-up study for the industrial park area. Well, you, you would in in your presentation refer to an archaeological study. Ah, okay, the historical part. That was in there more to uh, say as each each proposal comes forward, it was envisioned as being a, sort of a check off um, to make sure that there weren't anything that there wasn't anything significant or there was something maybe significant that, that should be should be. Uh, Redaylighted, so to speak. But these kinds of things, we're not talking about artifacts, clearly. It's more about weaving that theme of history through it. So if there's a way to suggest to a developer, how about if we, you know, you've got something great there and that's where the schoolhouse used to stand and would you think about a schoolhouse theme? I, I don't know. That's really what it was about. The, you raise a good point about the um, investigation. I think 
that may be a little heavy because I don't think we have anything that really merits that. But I think that language came from sort of standard archaeological how you do it. For, his, for the historical preservation. We are not in that mode here in, city, in the city of Edina. We simply do, uh, we can do uh, historical area designations, but we don't go take it typically to a national level. I believe that was national la language, national level language. Mr. Strauss. Yeah, um, Commissioner, I, thank you, it's very good. I mean, I do I heard it, but um, perhaps, um, uh, Commissioner Nimiroff um, suggested about the, the connection with the business park or the industrial park. And maybe um, you can expand how we, we looked at that and, and it's, it's an obvious connection and how it relates and how they function together, but maybe some of what we saw as the limitations or what we see as future next steps um, involving sure. that, that, that area, because it's a significant part of that key hill corner right so interestingly enough when we started this process we didn't even have the study area boundaries defined uh, we knew that it meant really focusing on the corner of 70th and cahill but how far to take it the the, the railroad tracks clearly provide a natural barrier um, and then anything south of the study area is truly all industrial we realized too that this is the northwest corner of the entire industrial area uh, just happens to have the railroad tracks right through it which makes sense for the time that's how everything came into the area so um, from actually back in the 2008 comp plan process it was identified that potentially this whole Cahill industrial area needed to be looked at further because that was where it's going to change so this is truly just step one because it is an area that that needs revitalization sooner rather than later. Soon to follow will be the industrial park area. What is that area uh, in the future? What is the greatest need for that? We've already seen some different types of uses coming into it. What used to be strictly warehousing or manufacturing, some office is now, uh, I think, a hockey rink. I think there's a brewery back there. Uh, there's some batting cages. So there's different uses, and I think that's, uh, that was the point of the plan was to say, uh, sit, the city needs to understand better what those uses are, and if indeed should there be housing in the study area one day, do we want to facilitate people getting from this area across the tracks without having to go all the way down K Hill or all the way around to 77th? Any other? Um, I have a couple. So on under implementation the economic vitality implementation, there was a section about um, using use of public fi financing. And so a couple of those bullet points uh, were that, you know, to make it clear to property owners and the community that public financing may only be used for public realm infrastructure. And then there's another piece that says, should public financing be proposed for the study area, um, the city will provide information, justify and explain the financial benefits to the community. So I just wanted to make sure, um, so was that kind of covered or reviewed with what the actual, because you're talking TIF, right? Um, that is referring to TIF, yes. And uh, that is a good question because I think we discussed that in our work session and I think there was a sort of a conclusion drawn that really what we're, what, what the plan's trying to get at is, is a level of transparency. So it's not to say that TIF should not be used. It's not to dictate when it could be used. But the understanding by the work group was, well, it's really only for public realm improvements. But as someone else brought up during our work session, it, it, in some ways it can be used for what the city deems to meet its goals. So right. um, I think some rewording or tweaking of that okay. is required. Okay. But there was that real desire to be uh, forthcoming that should that be used as a tool, a financing tool, that there be clear guidelines or uh, an explanation just so that for residents' sake that they're, they're on board. Okay. And so I guess, Carrie, just kind of throwing that back to you. I know TIF, we're not really the TIF, you're not the TIF guru, but so you're comfortable with that or working with, um, you know, just kind of generalizing that? 
Yeah, and as it says, it's the city council is the lead, and it's in response to development proposals. Um, so I, I think, I think okay, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then the other one, of course, is, you know, talking the height and the density, and as we know, we'll get a proposal, you know, that will push that. And as much as we'll, you know, want to say, nope, this is a, you know, this is, we'll still get those requests. And so what I didn't really notice in here, and I apologize if I missed it, but is there something where, and I know I don't want to use the give to get, but is there some kind of, um, any language that does kind of accommodate that? Should that happen? You know, what, what would the city be looking for? Because we know, we know it's going to come. And is there something like even above and beyond what you've got within this plan that would be one of the, the reasons to consider it? Right. I think that is the one question that uh, <clears throat> is giving everyone heartburn. I think whether we're si sitting on that side or if it's city council or if it's city staff or if it's residents, I think it needs to be noted that that tool for negotiation has always been and always will be the jurisdiction of the city council. They ultimately have the right to decide on behalf of the residents what they feel is best. Whether that takes the form of a variance or a comp plan amendment, that is, that is there at their disposal. What I think this plan and the work group was clear on was they did not want to weigh in on what those parameters would be. So in this work plan, or the small area plan, it's very clear what the expectation is. And in some sense, you could almost look at it and say, it's not negotiable. It's all there. This is what is expected. Obviously, any given proposal will, will fall short there and exceed others. But I think in the big picture, everyone does understand that. So it's not so much a checklist. You didn't make it here. You didn't make it there. But as an overall thing, um, if there were to be a proposal that's of greater height or greater density, it would be for the planning commission and the city council to make the case, as they always do. So um, I think what's really great about this plan is it's clear. Everything in there, I don't think there's any, any wish list about it. It's this is what this village should be. This is what it should look like. Now let's see how com close you can come to it. So I, that is probably, um, that's the closest I can come to an answer. Thank you. Commissioner Nebra. It's more of like just a question about order. Are, are we at a later part in tonight's meeting? We're going to hear from the public, then after that we'll have an opportunity to have further discussion, correct? We don't need to discuss issues that have... Yeah, this is yeah. just a point where we can ask Susan questions or Jerry questions. Thank you. Thanks for clarifications. Yeah. Commissioner. Just one clarification. Uh, the area that looks like it's to take advantage of opportunities connecting east and west a little south of 70th over the tracks. Um, can you just explain some of the logistics that exist on the east side to make that happen? I know uh, Commissioner Miranda brought up, well, maybe it could start as a pedestrian bike crossing first and then move to automobile. Because it doesn't look like there's a road readily accessible to tie into, so is it public drive? I mean... Oh, are you talking about down here? Yeah. So yeah. once it crosses east, what, what does that look like now and just so we're aware of? Oh, I wish I, we had a diagram here. Actually, this aligns pretty well with a cul-de-sac right here on this side. So there are some buildings right here now and here, and then there's a cul-de-sac. So that's why this location was chosen. Also, it was more or less the end of our study area. I think is this, the, this is the film tech building, I believe. So... Um, yeah, that could even change in the future. We left it with that assumption and, um, and proposed this location. Right now, to get into sort of this, this, this area, the commercial area, you, you would enter here. And that does work, but it doesn't facilitate much through past the, the railroad tracks. So that's why this grid is being expanded a bit to kind of include that as an option. 
Um, initially, I think it was seen more as a pedestrian bike access because there's some question about can you put cars over that railroad track, whereas we know it's, it's much simpler if you're going to do just pedestrians. But again, there's a lot of right-of-way issues involved, so it's really a suggestion of the plan. Um, and should a development proposal come forth where somehow maybe that would actually facilitate this, the design of it, that's more the reason to have it there in, in the plan now. Okay. Good. Thank you, Susan. So this is a public hearing, and so we'll open it up for the public comments. And you can use either one of the podiums, just like a... And um, you get three minutes, so just keep an eye on the green light when it turns red. And then um, just please state your name and address. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, Louise Wright is... There's two of us. Six minutes? <laughs> Can I push it? <laughs> okay. Louise Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, 5422 Creekview Lane. That's a single family dwelling. Um... My whole sense of reference, we live directly at the top of Cape Hill and Sevilla, behind the apartment building. Yeah, well, it's not on a line of apartment. But we live um, just opposite uh, Seventieth Street and Cape Hill. So if you okay. were to continue up Cape Hill and continue north, you'd be in our backyard okay. if you went through the apartment building okay. there. And that's really one of our really big concerns is that that north side of 70th was not part of the original plan, and those, that's been included now in the possibility of being in multi-family dwellings. There are apartment buildings there now. The side that faces the street is only two stories. There are three stories in the back, um, and our property butts right up against the back of those pro apartment buildings, and putting three-story apartment buildings on the street side there would make them four stories um, butting up against our property, which I think would be a really significant change to the value of our property um, and our ability to enjoy our backyard um, with those apartment buildings looking over us. There are three or four houses that are immediately behind those apartment buildings. Um, so that's a really big issue, obviously, for us. Um, one of the other things, in the first part of the statements about the purpose of all of this was a statement that says that the area is emerging, do you want it to emerge as a 21st century village within what was once a first-ring suburb and today is transitioning into an urban city. I don't know of many Edina residents who think we should be transitioning into an urban city. Um, I think that's what this recent election was really about. Um, I think we still want to be a suburb. Um, and the question of the density of the development at Cahill Village um, has a lot to do with, are we going to suddenly be a piece of city on that corner? Um, anybody who lives there currently knows that the traffic is already a mess. I don't know how we can accommodate a huge number of additional cars. The area is bounded on one side by the railroad tracks on the other side by um, a number of residential multi-unit buildings. There are no through streets, so the only place it goes through is 70th, or you have to go all the way down 
to the other side of the film tech. Um, at five o'clock now, the traffic backs up from Metro Boulevard all the way back up to the stop sign at, at Cahill. Sorry, you've got your red light, and if you guys want to continue, Sorry. you can switch. <laughs> I'll yield my time. Uh, we can't do that. We can't do that? Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Fundamentally, uh, I think Louise hit the big picture. This is too much, way too much for this area for us. And I, I, I acknowledge the effort that's gone into this, and I apologize on our behalf that we weren't there to share our thoughts earlier. Um, we've had a, a number of issues in our family that have preoccupied our time as caregivers and otherwise. Um, so this is really our first chance to spend time on this and to share our thoughts with you. It's too much. It's too many people. The density is too high. Um, that is not to say we would love to see some renewal there. We absolutely do. That's why we moved there, because it's charming in its own kind of uh, oldish, uh, you know, rundown kind of way, which is OK. The good part about that is it gives people an opportunity with low rents to try out new businesses. And I don't want to see that change. There's been a number of wonderful restaurants that have come through there and that are now sticking around because they can afford to. This is going to change that. It'll absolutely change that. The rents are going to go up. No way they could sustain themselves um, without higher rents in that area. Um, five stories? I'm not going to live in a neighborhood with five stories. No way. I'm sorry. That's not the density we're looking at. The traffic is going to go out of this world. There'll be no way for people to get in and out of that area. And then there's the emergency vehicles issue during rush hour. You're looking at widening streets if you really want to be serious about this. You've got to get four lanes on both ways, on Cahill up there and also on 70th Street. You've got to get two, another two lanes over that train track. No way, not going to happen. Then you've got to amend the issues down at 70th and Metro. There's nothing there that can accommodate that kind of a traffic. You're going to have to do the same thing down there. It's just not enough. Um, so again, I'm, I'd love to see some renewal there. I'd love to see some multifamily facilities for people who can't afford to live in our neighborhoods now. The notion of having people who work here be able to afford to live here, that's why we moved here. Um, we've lived here for 22 years, and we've worked in the Edina community for 22 years. My wife is a physician, and I've, I've done a lot of different things in the community. So we like it here. We like it there. We've raised a family there. Um, we have a small cul-de-sac. This is going to change the nature of that backyard for the whole cul-de-sac. We won't be able to get in and out of there without having to get up much earlier to get to commute to work. Not going to happen. Um, the, the piece is, I'll say it again, Louise said it, I'll say it again. I think the community spoke to this quality of development in this election. Not what Edina wants to see, and not what we want to see in our backyard. Yeah, I'm a NIMBY. I'm game for something. I'm game for some improvement there, but not this. Way too much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Thank you. Uh, my name is John Steckman. I live at 7460 Shannon Drive, which is just on the other side of Lewis Park, beautiful neighborhood. And I'd like to thank the committee. I think they did a great job of putting together a plan. I, I did read it all, which uh, was very well done. I mean, it's still unclear to me even reading it, you know, what the mix of retail, commercial, residential is. I know there's discussion about density, but I would love to know, like, how many people are you talking even in a range? Because uh, I'd say my main concern is the, uh, the school system. And uh, you know, Creek Valley is the school that supports that. Creek Valley has been a great school. I had three uh, high schoolers. Um, you know, it really can't take in too many more kids. And, and I, it's probably more people contemplating this than in the city I grew up in, which had a you know, full high school. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm just curious what's driving the issue of you know, who decided we need a lot more people in that area or in Edina in general. I mean, I think, um, I mean, 
I don't know. I, that, that, that's one question I'd like to follow up on. The other thing is, I'll try to get some questions out and I can follow up with the form. Um, you know, the, it referenced the uh, feedback from the community. It, it wasn't attached in the uh, attachment, so I'd like to see, you know, how many people attended those meetings and what kind of feedback was, was gathered. Um, there certainly is concern about um, the, uh, you know, the, the mix of, I mean, I'm all for a mix of uh, affordable housing and, and that. Um, I don't think it's fair if, if Edina has a plan to put all them in all the affordable housing in this, this in unit. So I, I hope that's spread across all of Edina fairly. I don't know where that's addressed or where that would be addressed. Um, I'd be curious about the, you know, the tax base increase and really the number of families, the number of students involved. Um, so that, that was my comments, so thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, whoops, is this on? Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Michelle Swanson. I'm here on behalf of Excel Energy tonight. Excel Energy is located at 5309 West 70th Street in Edina. And as you know, we're an adjacent property owner to the study area for the small area plan. We support the overall concept of the small area plan and want to continue to work with the various stakeholders involved in the process. We've been an active participant during the development of this plan including attending community meetings, discussing our operations, and some of our concerns with the small area planning group, city staff, and its consultants. Based on our review of the draft plan, we still have a couple of what I would call significant concerns. Our first concern is with the proposed east-west parkway on the southern edge of our property. We have significant infrastructure in that area. If you were to go Go walk into that area, you would see major overhead lines. Um, and we have a number of underground facilities that exit our substation that's located at this site and cross in the area, underground, of course, of the proposed new roadway. Um, if a road were to go through there, it is likely that those Philly facilities would most likely need to be re relocated. In addition, it's difficult to tell from the exhibits in the draft as to whether the city would need to acquire some property in this area in order to construct the new road. If you were to walk along that area, there are areas along this proposed roadway that are extremely narrow uh, between our property and the buildings on the other side of the proposed road. And requiring some of our property for this road could significantly affect our yard operations and potentially increase the number of underground facilities that would be in conflict with this new road. Um, depending on the location of the road within the corridor that we're talking about in the elevation, that could conflict with our transmission structure, which is located right near the railroad tracks, which is what you want to cross to bring the road through there. With an at-grade crossing near the structure, we'd be concerned about the proximity of the road to the transmission structure, because we need minimum distances between our structure and the road in order to maintain access to the structure and avoid vehicle strikes. The proposed east-west road appears to be, uh, ex poses extensive and complex, con com and complex conflicts with our operations. Costs to relocate these facilities would be significant. And they'd be a significant expense to the city. We would recommend another location be found for the proposed road. I understand what you're trying to do in terms of trying to get uh, traffic through there, but at a very minimum, um, we think that proposed location for the road be removed from the small area planning, or at least be removed and studied further before included in the small area plan. I'm gonna run out of time here. The second concern, the passenger rail platform that is being suggested. Based on the plan, it appears to conflict with our transmission structure on our, uh, near our property. And that transmission tower that it conflicts with is, all our transmission towers are important, but that's a significant one because all four sets of our conductors that feed power to the Edina substation is that structure that it's in conflict with. So we would recommend that you find a new location because relocating a transmission tower, or maybe more than one, um, would be difficult and costly again. Um, and I will finish, I have one small point, but those were my two main points, thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Steve Halloway. Uh, I live at 4809 Towns Road in Edina. And I apologize, I thought the 50th in France plan was on the agenda tonight. So if there's an opportunity to make that, make a comment on that topic, I'd love to do so. That's it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roger Bildston, B-I-L-D-S-T-E-N. I am a 30-plus year Edina resident, and I rise uh, to uh, compliment the commission on the study and voice my general support. I live at 6813 Brook Drive, so we back up basically on the trail. I think it's a wonderful asset for Edina. Um, a small detail, as a regular user of the trail, please be aware that access to it, as you mentioned, is dangerous from anywhere west or north. Um, if you're trying to put children across 70th or a wheelchair or anybody who can't move fast, it's dangerous and we need to fix it sooner rather than later. But I generally applaud the effort to develop and fix the area. Uh, it's a great opportunity for Edina, and I hope that any references to the recent election don't discourage you from the need for us to think well into the future and plan for the future and do things. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Philip Peterson. I live at 5519 West 70th Street. I uh, happen to have been a member of the, this group that uh, presented this study, and, uh, and I happen to vote against the study. <clears throat> what I'm here to speak about specifically has to do with affordable housing. In the view of the recent actions by the city, by the Edina Housing Foundation, I believe there is reason to carefully consider the potential for affordable housing in the 70th and Cahill study area. Currently, there is no limitation on affordable housing. Let me explain that. Uh, but first, let me just tell you, our group never considered the possibility last spring and summer that the Waldorf Nevins property could be redeveloped for subsidized housing at 100 to 200 percent of the maximum density limit contained in our report. Or that the same thing might occur on other parcels within the study area. The city's affordable housing policy approaches the inclusion of affordable units from the viewpoint of a developer. The developer should re be required to include some affordable units in his project. In effect, the developer starts from the basis of zero, and the city strives for a 10 to 20% allocation, and somewhere along the continuum, they agree. However, when considering vacant land, or the overall canvas of redevelopable property as in the case of 70th and Cahill. If the foundation or any other affordable housing firms acquire additional land in the study area, there is no 10 to 20% limitation. Therefore, it is possible under a yet unforeseen circumstances, and perhaps highly unlikely, but that the entire area once rezoned, could legally become a low-income enclave. It must be assumed that the City Council viewed the 10 to 20 percent range to, to provide a reasonable balance between market rates and affordable rates and to spread affordable housing throughout the city. 
to give the neighborhood assurance that the 10 to 20 percent will apply to the study area and will encourage strong market rate potential for the remainder of the area, it would seem reasonable and appropriate to establish a single maximum density across the entire study area and then apply 10 to 20 percent to that. As an example, if the maximum density is 50 units per acre, then based on 13 acres of developable land south of 70th, the maximum dwelling units would be 650. There would then be a range of 65 to 130 affordable housing units. If the maximum density was lower, then the available affordable units would be reduced accordingly. Then I, it should also be noted I'm that sorry, the foundation I'm, parcel. Mr. Peterson, it, sorry. I'm, I'm right to the end. Okay. Okay. I'm get quick. <laughs> it should be noted that the foundation parcel, parcel is the only parcel along 70th Street or Cahill that does not have the three story setback, therefore allowing five stories right up to 70th Street. Thank you for the opportunity to have served on the SAPWIG and for making these comments. And I can make a copy of this available. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, John Euchre. I'm at uh, 7105 Fleetwood. Uh, my concern relates to the increased density and people in the area and having the adequate traffic studies to think about the repercussions in that if 70th and Cahill start to bottleneck like could happen, the next, um, the next road south that can go east to Cahill is Dewey Hill. So if somebody lives north of 70th and they want to get to Dewey Hill to get to 494, the easiest way right now, 70 to Cahill, no problem. But if that area is busy traffic, what's the next best way? Lanham to Fleetwood to Dewey Hill. I live in Fleetwood. What happens if that becomes a traffic path for people to get around 70th and Cahill? That's a huge problem. You know, kids play outside. There could be multiple cars going down a residential street. I mean. And so I just want to make sure that the, an adequate study is being done of the traffic patterns to make sure that there are adequate ways around that area for people that don't want to go to that intersection. Because if everybody's going there, then how are we going to get around it? Most places with five plus stories have four lanes of traffic. I mean, you know, 50th and, not 50th in France, but west of 100 on Vernon, that area, there's a lot more roadways to get around. And that's where these type of buildings are going. I just don't see how the increase of people is going to be able to support the traffic patterns and not negatively affect the residents who live on the streets in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Duffy. I live at 6001 Dublin Circle. I've uh, been a Edina resident for 24 plus years. Um, I haven't had a chance to go through the entire thing, um, but in scanning through that, um, a couple of items I've noted, it appears of others have noted as well. Um, one of the first items was that we're uh, wanting to transition from a first ring to a, a suburb to an urban city, and I, I guess I don't know where that comes from. I, I, I would echo the comment that was made earlier. I don't know if that's what the majority of the people were expecting when they moved to a diner or not. Um, the second thing I would uh, note is that the traffic issues that others have raised, that was one of the first things that came to my mind as well. Uh, it's already busy. If you look at, um, particularly with the schools, and it ties in with the school system, uh, the additional multi-density um, adding to this population of schools, which is already uh, quite large, very large school, you're only having more people leave the Edina school system. If you go to the other schools, you find they're filled, Benil, some of the other ones, they won't take people anymore because there's too many from Edina trying to leave. But just as far as density, increasing that, the traffic pattern along 70th, it can be backed up in the mornings um, past Antrim and down on 70th Street trying to get people to, into and out of the schools. And so I'm wondering if when they talk about uh, increasing with higher density, if they've considered, as others have said, the traffic concern and issues that that will raise, particularly, again, when you dovetail that with a, a crowded school system already and people trying to get in and out of the school system, uh, 
it really backs up. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Kruthi Shukla. I live at 7213 Fleetwood Drive. Um, I agree with the, the conversation that's been about traffic at 70th and Cahill. I already think that it's congested and I can't see how it can accommodate that many more units. Um, I've been kind of listening to what's been happening in that Cahill area and as a house that lives really close to that, we were always hoping that it would be restaurants and places where people can meet and I feel like we're kind of shifting away from that and looking at more housing and I feel like it's gonna deteriorate the property and I worry about the congestion and our kids playing in the streets as well. I live down the same street kind of on Fleetwood Drive and if that's where the traffic's gonna be backing up to, I can see all of that property value decreasing. So it'd be unfortunate if it happened. Thanks. Planning commissioners, my name is Hope Melton. I live at 4825 Valley View Road in Edina. I'm also coordinator of a citizen group here in Edina called uh, Edina Neighbors for Affordable Housing. And I've gone to a number of these hearings and what I hear over and over again is um, we know we need affordable housing, we're not, afford we're not against affordable housing, but then they say um, there's too much density. You, they, they basically, you basically don't want the density and height that will make it economically feasible to do it. And I'd just like to remind everyone that um, Edina kept affordable housing out of this city for about 20 years. And they did that with height and zoning restrictions that make it unfeasible and, and lot size, that make it unfeasible to put in, economically unfeasible to put in affordable housing. So if we're gonna change that, and the city council is committed to doing so, um, we have to have additional height and density. It doesn't have to be incompatible with residential areas, but I think three to five stories and maybe six uh, is, is, not, uh, is not unreasonable and would under certain market conditions, which change all the time, under certain market conditions uh, would, make it, would make it affordable, would make affordable housing possible. Um, finally, the Edina affordable housing policy does uh, require 10% affordable housing at 50% AMI and 20% uh, and at 60% AMI. 60% AMI, by the way, is about $80,000. I think what a lot of people don't understand is that affordable housing is not only a poor people's problem these days. There are wide swaths of the middle class that need affordable housing. And these are teachers, these are nurses, these are uh, our police, these are our city staff. And so if you have a building at 60% AMI, 20% affordable at 60% AMI, that's who you're talking about. So if you don't enable the height and density to make it economically feasible, those are the people you're keeping out. And also a large percent of our senior population that wants to downsize but cannot find, and they want to stay in this community, they've been in this community for 40 years, and they can't find affordable housing to continue to live here. So think about that. Finally, um, what I was going to say about the Edina uh, affordable housing policy, the inclusionary zoning policy, is that yes, it does make those 10 and 20 percent requirements, but it does not preclude a building at 100 percent affordable housing with various categories of affordability, which is what I think the Edina housing uh, policy is proposing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I'm Connie Carino, 4509 Garrison Lane in Edina, and I was a member of the 70th Cahill Small Area Plan Work Group. I wasn't really sure if I was going to uh, comment during this public hearing, but I changed my mind once I read the proposed amendment language from Director Teague. And let me preface my comments by saying that um, after attending your work session two weeks ago, I really understand why as planning commissioners and staff you might feel these changes are needed. It's not an easy job where you sit, and uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors I know that go into your decisions. But I encourage you to adopt our small area plan recommendations, and instead of the amendment, I'd like to offer you another option to consider. Um, just a couple other background um, comments first. As you are aware, uh, we've, we met for almost a year. The recommendations in the draft plan are part of the community engagement process, and they reflect the, um, the input from community stakeholders who took time to attend our meetings, and also those that provided information from the surveys. But even um, after all those meetings, our small area plan work group, we struggled, and we struggled a lot with two key issues on height and density. So the draft is admittedly more aspirational than specific, but that's exactly what it should be. As part of the city's comprehensive plan, it should help guide, it shouldn't dictate, it shouldn't prescribe, it shouldn't react to a specific development project because when we were working on it, we didn't have a specific project. But still it offers some zoning changes to consider that would allow the vision and principles to be achieved, including what the community could and should expect around the sensitive issue of building heights, especially building heights in a, um, a, in a valued neighborhood node like 70th and Cahill. Um, where we really struggled was on density, and it seems from your work session that that's also giving you pause today. So here's my suggest suggestion. Instead of amending our, our small area plan recommendations, consider editing Director Teague's proposed language and apply that or create a new section of the land use chapter of the comp plan um, that provides an overview of how you might use amendments for various parts of of um, the, the land use um, and in the comp plan. It could be an introduction, it could be an overview, but it shouldn't be just specific to our 70th and Cahill small area plan. Um, <clears throat> let's see here, sorry I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to shorten. So I, I think the community needs to know what to expect, but also as residents, we need to allow you to, um, to make changes and use the variance and amendment process. Successful businesses don't create 10-year plans that paralyze their progress and nor should our city. So I, I do agree you need the tool, but I think you should adopt our small area plan and move that along to the city council and find another way to handle um, specific projects that might require some amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Patrick Bennett. I live at 5708 Cambridge Drive, uh, which is just to the west of Lewis Park. Uh, I want to thank the Commissioners, and I want to thank the Small Area Plan group, including some of our neighbors that contributed. I participated in the forums in both March and May. And I think what you have here is a compromise. While I personally think it's too dense, it's a compromise. And um, Two other points, I'll echo the point about concern about school density. You've heard that several times. I think the election results cannot be ignored. You have a planning, you have a city council election that the number one vote getter ran completely on the issue of slowing down development and taking a more uh, planful approach, got the most votes. We need to listen to that as a council overall and as a planning commission. Uh, I also think that the points in the plan about allowing businesses to really be focused on the bike trail are, are unfounded. I, you, as noted in the plan, we live in the second highest affluent community. We are lacking a grocery store without having to travel far. We are lacking restaurants and gathering spaces. 
Um, we had a private party that was willing to invest in our community about seven or eight years ago. You may recall they were willing to put a new warming house at Lewis Park. Private funds. The community rallied around and said, no thanks, they didn't want it. I asked this commission, I asked the city council to listen to the residents that are, are opposed to the congestion and the density and the traffic concerns that have been raised tonight. Similar to the way that was, you listened to the community before. Finally, I, um, I am serious concerns about the Edina Housing Foundation acquiring the property before this plan is approved and already an amendment being proposed that is double the density of what's in this plan. That circumvents the entire process and it, it, it's, it's challenging to participate and to feel like you have a voice and then have that upended at the very end. That's really troubling. And I would hope that we give that the proper course of listening to the residents and we discuss and debate that. My serious concern about this is 100 units there. I'm not against affordable housing. What I'm concerned about is all of it coming here to this quadrant of Edina and to this parcel of land in this small plan area, okay? And the, it, what, what, I, what I believe will occur is if we allow that to continue at that density, then it will predetermine the outcome of this entire area. You will have a hard time getting a developer to develop the rest of that parcel of land for condo and rental units with retail at the first floor, as has been proposed. That's my concern. Let's not let that predetermined outcome occur from one part of the city agenda. Thank you. I'm Ann Swenson. I live at 6021 Concord. Um, my past history is I sat on a planning commission, yours, for 10 years, 12 years on council, and I now sit on the foundation. So I choose to come up here now after the previous speaker. A couple things that we need to correct as to what's happened. Actually, there is some zoning there that goes to four stories. Currently, the old um, dry cleaners is a four story zone area of that section. It isn't all just two and three stories. Also, it's not a limitation that we put on as a council for affordable housing. It was a way of getting affordable housing into apartments and condos that were being built, 20 units or more. So it wasn't to limit the number in a unit, it was to make them do it. There's a big difference in that. Um, yes, the foundation was able to buy the old dry cleaning site. Uh, we started a year ago, actually, and didn't end up being able to close on it until July. It's zoned for four stories right now, even if you kept it at four stories, it, if it were housing. It's a great location. It backs up to a bike path. It's on a bus lane. You know, I would love to have a grocery store there, but you only have 5,000 cars that go through your intersection, no matter how much you hear about the traffic. A grocery store will never build anything now that isn't within 25 to 30,000 cars a day. So that node is great. I love nodes. I worked really hard, as Connie Carino will tell you, on my Valley View Wooddale node. But nodes have specific things that people will build into them. And they need enough people in the neighborhood, enough people living there to be able to use them and to keep going there. That node had four coffee shops that have closed there. It's struggling. I get it. And I want to see it revive. Re revived and, and lively there. Affordable housing isn't gonna stop that revival. Affordable housing is workforce housing. It's not, you don't build housing there. You don't build housing there for seniors that need affordable housing because it's not close enough to medical. You build houses there for single moms. You build houses there for families. You build houses there for the para that works in the Edina school systems that makes $24,000 a year and can't live in Edina. That's what you're building affordable housing for. Those people create part of your neighborhood. They're good neighbors. And so I would be really disappointed if you would look at that piece of property, the foundation, as a stumbling block for this neighborhood because that's the first change that's even been considered for this neighborhood. It's not gonna be 100 to 200 times the density. The only question I have that you are doing in density is if you have a five-story building or a four-story building, 
50 units an acre is not what you would build if you built commercial for sale condos or apartments. There, it's, that's not the number you would ever have. It's more than that. So you kind of picked a density number almost out of a hat. And I'm worried that that's going to mean that you're really not going to get any turnover there at all in the future for the rest of the parcels. I'm not worried about the foundation piece. I'm worried about the rest of your corner. It's a really important corner in Edina. All the nodes are because what we've discovered in Edina, we like to walk to nodes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katherine Bass. I'm at 6917 Gleason Road. Um, I first want to say thanks to the residents who all engaged in the meetings and the surveys and the online opportunities to contribute feedback and build the plan. Um, the residents, um, many of whom are sitting here in the audience, um, the property and business owners who served on the small area planning working group for their efforts to thoughtfully engage the neighborhood. Um, I've served on working groups in the city and commissions, and I know it's a lot of work. And I also know that many of the members you know, sort of went above and beyond to make sure that people knew about the engagement opportunities. So I really appreciate that. Um, this is the kind of thing that we have to do, uh, plan for the future, so that when we get development proposals, we have some agreements in place. Um, and the community knows what to expect, and the council can um, make good decisions. I've lived in the neighborhood for 18 years. My background and training is in public health. And my training in my life has taught me that being healthy, healthy is deeply connected and influenced by the places and conditions where we live, work, and play. So building a healthy community is like putting together a puzzle. We have to have beautiful public spaces, access to healthy foods, meaningful work, housing for many ages and incomes, and quality learning opportunities in addition to a lot of other things. I personally have longed for improvements at 70th and Cahill because this is the node that my family uses. Um, we frequent the restaurants there. We love the services. Um, but I've wanted improvements, and I want an area that's really worthy of the neighborhood. Um, as the small area plan notes, it's excessively car oriented and it's always felt dangerous for my kids to walk or bike there and it's not a place where I want to spend a lot of time. Um, I support the sm small area plan. I'm excited about the principles and the vision. I want a beautiful village green where my family can hang with other families, where I can walk to shops that are vibrant with life. And I believe that moderate amounts of density called for in the plan are appropriate and necess necessary to realize that dream. I'm particularly excited about the opportunity to add a diversity of housing options, especially for folks who work in Edina and folks who have lived in Edina for a really long time and want an option to their single family home and want to stay here. Um, I want their expertise and their wisdom to stay in this community. I don't want them to have to go elsewhere. Um, but there are many, many folks who work in Edina, their wages have not kept pace with the rapid growth in the values of single family homes and they can't find places to, to buy here or rent. And I think those that serve this community should be able to live here and our shared prosperity depends on it. I love the attention to the goal of an inviting place for people, especially pedestrians and those riding bikes. And the goal of minimizing auto orientation of new buildings is a good one. drive throughs are not wanted in this node and I'll be holding decision makers to that. Um, so just a little flag there. Uh, I would really encourage you to see this plan as a set of agreements with the neighbors um, based on a thoughtful process and the efforts of the working group to create a shared vision. I would offer this note of caution though, please don't approve this plan if either the planning commission or the council is not prepared to hold developers to the agreements herein. Because this is what breaks trust and causes heartache, heartache and worry to neighbors. Thank you. My name is Paul <clears throat> Mordenero, 5800 West 70th Street. I will not be as organized as that young lady. Uh, there is a um, pros and cons. We've heard back and forth, and I waited till the end. 
one thing that resonated with Ms. Lee's comment at the very end, what is great about this plan, it is clear. I cannot agree at all with that comment. And I don't think we can agree on that comment. There are more questions than answers. We are shooting, I think, from the hip. Do we like three stories, five stories? We heard six stories just recently. I think we need stress tests from outside experts to address traffic because traffic equals safety. And I think safety is potentially gonna be compromised because of the density issue. It might not be, but I think we need to do our homework uh, much more than we've seen in this plan. That's all I have. Great, is there any other public comment? Is there a motion? Move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. So now we will bring it back to the Planning Commission for comments. And thank you for all the public comments. So um, I don't know if you want, I mean, we heard a lot about traffic, school system, urban density, kind of the basics, what we typically hear. So um, do you want to start? Go for it. You have a comment? So. A lot of people seem to be really curious about whether there were any studies on the traffic. I was just wondering if there were any studies conducted and what the results were. I think that's a great lead in. And I think that, Sue, you can adjust this further, but there were clearly a lot of um, points in this plan where you're going to require traffic studies with anything that's being proposed. Yes. Um, our, our work group was provided uh, a traffic study by the consultant who looked at the current numbers now. And there's always, I think in my mind, a question mark about how accurate they are. You've seen those, those tapes they lay down on the road and uh, they do projections and they try to know what peak hour is and where people are coming from. But it didn't identify any serious issues at the current time. So uh, that's not to say that you don't experience backups, but I think what they're saying in, tra in the traffic language, a certain amount of backups at certain points in time are to be expected. Our work group just went off that information, but it did not account for any assumptions about if you were to provide additional development. What our report says, there's capacity. And again, we don't get numbers in terms of, well, what's that mean? So yes, it's, it's not a specific science, but we operated in good faith that there was capacity for greater development. Um, I think there's some comments that were made about um, traffic and concern for greater density. They are related, but how much of an impact that has, again, we won't know until we actually have a traffic study. And any proposal that does come before us will be required to have a traffic study. Kerry, did you want to say something on that? Sure, I, I can add to that. Um, so yes, with any development proposal that would come through, a traffic study would be required. Um, I also want to mention, too, that in general, housing is going to generate less traffic than commercial. So you've got an entirely commercial node here. So there may be instances where we're removing, take the dry cleaners, for example, <clears throat> um, a traffic study would compare how much traffic that use generates compared to a residential. Um, and those numbers could come back less as we're taking away retail or office and replacing it with housing. But um, the big picture question, yes, with any development proposal, a traffic study would be required. Commissioner Bennett. Yeah, one question to follow up with Carrie. Are you or anyone aware, or maybe the small area plan working group, aware of any current plans for any of those intersections or roadways by the city? I mean, that particular intersection, you know, where it has a T with a stop sign, those are always known to back up. Same thing happens in Valley View, Wooddale. 
Wh I'm what? not aware of any. Okay. All right. I think lots of folks in the group talked about some common issues. One of the issues was urban, and I don't, I'm speaking for the small area planning group, and I probably shouldn't, I should let you do it, but we didn't call it urban. Met Council called Edina an urban transition, and it simply reflects what they said we were, not what we said we were. Um, and that's their definition, not ours. Could you talk a little bit about what you know about the schools and school capacity because that's been discussed in lots of forums before and how it might affect your small area plan? You know, I've asked that question a lot and um, my understanding, and I'll, I might, might defer to Kerry, he might have a better idea, but that is that the city and the school district do uh, compare uh, development, uh, growth, and look at those numbers. Um, when we were doing this report, obviously when you bring in housing, you um, are increasing the number of people who are going to be living in the area. Again, we couldn't make a prediction. We don't even know would they be, generally families you'd think would be two-bedroom, three-bedroom, larger units. But we found in a lot of cases now they're going to micro units, studios, one-bedrooms. So it, it's hard to even get your head around about what the impact is on the schools. But I have heard several times that uh, this particular school, which I think it's Creek Valley, it may have some classrooms that are right now at capacity. But when I've talked to school board members, their opinion is that the system itself is not overburdened. So we do have some conflicting information, and in some way, I do wish that there would be a statement coming from the school district to weigh in on this because it does make it difficult for every proposal that we review or every small area plan that we do that everyone is, is very concerned about the schools, which I think is legitimate, but we really just don't have a good answer to that. So then I'm going to pass it to Carrie to see what is, where are those times where something might get reviewed with the school district in terms of impact? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, staff in the school district do meet. We like to make the, anytime a there's a rezoning or a comprehensive plan amendment that involves housing. We let the school district know that that's coming. Um, generally, in some of our recent conversations with the school district, within this area, um, they felt better equipped to handle additional students than, say, the Southdale area. That's not to say they can't handle additional enrollment in that area. 15% of the existing enrollment in the school district is through open enrollment. And any time there's a new housing project that's proposed, it's usually a year or two out before it's even constructed. So the district has time to adjust potentially those open enrollment um, numbers. Maybe they pull back some. <clears throat> also, um, Hazel Reinhardt has done some studies with the school district and the city and the school district are planning to do a joint study um, to take a look at um, our demographics and increased enrollment. But generally in the past, she's indicated that these multifamily apartment developments, they generate 0.1 students per unit. So if there was a 100 unit um, new housing that goes in, that would generate 10 students so just in general. And we do have some numbers, um, the 71 France apartments, there was about 240 units there, and the 230 some, and the district has indicated to us that that generates, that, that there's 24 students living in those apartments. So again, that, that kind of supports um, Hazel Reinhardt's indication of the, the point one. Thank you, Commissioner Hamilton. Another piece that I feel obligated to say something about um, from what we heard, there seems to be a sense in the universe that planning city council, I don't want to speak for city council, I don't want to speak for planning, I'll speak for myself, is encouraging um, urbanization, growth. No, we're not. We're recognizing the forces that exist in the universe. If somebody tears down a house in your neighborhood, do you think that they're going to build a smaller one? They're going to build a bigger one. 
They bought a lot that already had existing facility on it. And so they had to put something in it that increased that value. This isn't undeveloped land. This is developed land that's worth a lot of money, at least if you ask the people who own it, they think it's worth a lot of money. So if it's going to change, it's going to change because someone is willing to make a fairly substantial investment, first to buy it, then to remove it, and then to build it. We're simply recognizing the forces that are out there. It's either leave it the way it is and say, Edina will not change. We'll learn to love exactly what we've got. Every defunct dry cleaner, every not grocery store, or we're gonna recognize the forces that are at work in the universe and say, what are they? Are we perfect at it? No. Are we trying hard to understand it? Yes. Um, do we believe that that change will require some densification? Probably. Just like, is it possible for someone to buy the house next door to yours and build a smaller one? Sure, it's happened, but it doesn't happen very often. So those are the things we're wrestling with. And we're not saying, gee, I think the best thing for Edina is let's move in, I don't know, you make up the number, 1,000 people. That's not what we're, what's driving it. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is say, if change comes, what might it be, and how do we do it creatively, constructively, to get the grocery store that you want, to get the restaurants that you want, to keep the buildings vital, to keep the tax base up, um, to keep the roads improved, and you can't do it by saying, I have an idea, let's make everything get smaller. It doesn't work that way. So that's what we're wrestling with. It doesn't mean we get it right, and it does mean that we need to hear what you have to say, but it does absolutely mean that what we're not trying to do is let's see how many people we can cram inside the Adina city limits. That's not our function, it never was. What we're trying to recognize is what's happening and how to control it and make it as positive as we can. So that's my two cents, and sorry, I didn't mean to waste your time. Commissioner Lee. Uh, I just wanted to respond to some of the comments that were made. There were a couple that uh, I had jotted down here. Um, I appreciated Ms. Swanson coming to the mic uh, on behalf of XL Energy, and I would like to make sure that we capture her comments. I'm thinking right now I jotted down here, and I thought, oh, why didn't we review this with her? We actually did have Michelle come in the beginning, and I'm glad that she stayed on, on task and, and was following along. So I think she raises some, some good points. And as far as that east-west Parkway Street, it probably does have some flexibility to be located elsewhere, but I think we're going we're gonna to run into some of the issues she identified. And it would be something that the city would have to commit to in terms of yeah, let's go for it. But it's not insurmountable. So I don't see it as something that is going to happen immediately, or maybe it never even happens. But uh, those kinds of issues, they're good to know right now. And I would like to get um, a, a copy of her. It looks like she might have had one other comment, but of, of her comment, so that we can look at that in the interim process. Um, also, uh, I did want to say that our appendix is probably not all, all inclusive and that that will contain the community meeting data and feedback. We did do a good job of documenting that, and you're correct. It's not in there, as well as some other things like the surveys uh, uh, with the business owners and uh, the developer uh, group that we had met with. Um, let me see. I, I did want to respond to the comment that the density is a number picked out of a hat. I, 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 ha I can say with great confidence that we looked to the best of our ability at many, many examples. It is a difficult concept, but it, it certainly wasn't a number just picked out of a hat. It was made with thought behind it and an understanding of what that means in terms of to the best of our ability, how much of the site could be occupied by a building of five stories high. What was unknown was, is it possible 
to have a five-story building with 50 units in it. And I believe there are proposals out there for that. So it, it actually gave me assurance that, yes, it is possible. I think that our planning commission and our city council needs to stand behind this plan and just, just take confidence that it is a good plan and then ask developers to meet the requirements. Again, it is specific in that we give a range. We would never be so prescriptive as to say they are all going to be three-story buildings. You may get a one-story building, a two-story building, a four-story building, and it's not all going to happen tomorrow. It may not even happen over the next 10 years. We've done plans like this, and still nobody steps forward. Of course, if that happened, that means we did do something wrong in the plan, because the point of this is to spur some change, which I think is what everybody's after. How much of a change is really borne by the market? And it very may well be that retail comes back, sort of these niche retails, uh, one of a kind, mom and pops, and they're just looking for places like this, for little shops, kind of walkable. And maybe there won't be a need to have a housing component. But why not at this point when all the data shows us and tells us that mixed use really is a good platform because you'll get a little bit of housing, you'll get a bit some retail, you'll allow a lot of things to happen, and this is in some ways uh, the perfect place for it. So I just wanted to say that uh, I, I am comfortable with the density level. Again, I probably personally err more on the lower end of that range, but we had to reach an agreement hence the range, 10 to 50. Could it go a little higher? I think that's sort of depends on what comes down before us in terms of a proposal. And then it would be up to the Planning Commission to say, does it merit going up to 60 or 70? What do we get for that? Or the council to say that. So, But what do we get for that is I think that the plan is very clear what it wants. So that should be what we get for it. So, Mr. Strauss. Yes, I, I think that a lot of the points have been covered. Uh, as a member of the Small Area Plan um, Committee, um, I just wanted to go over the process. We, you know, from the, com the community uh, meetings, the input, um, the, the members of the committee, you know, we, we originally looked at this and said, you know, do we leave it as it is, small changes or big changes? And collected um, information towards all those scenarios. And we had the economic development um, experts, we had developers, we had current property owners, business owners, neighbors, um, all of this input. So when we talked about how we arrived at our conclusions, um, I think we were very careful. It was a consensus and never, never unanimous. We're still not unanimous um, up until Right now, uh, this was um, an attempt to sort of um, what define where we want this area to go, not to design it. Even the kind of the layout of the 70th that was kind of part of all of those um, handouts showed the public side, the the improvements to the roadway, and that was a much you know the connectiveness to the economic, uh, the, 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 the industrial park to the neighborhood. Um, how do we tie that in more than, and to make the, and the public side experience, you know, more friendly and, and, um, and so we left the interior, you know, the private property, um, that'll develop as it develops. And, um, I guess that's where we're, you know, the, the, the project was, um, the, our best efforts to sort of resolve a lot of, a wide range of opinions and desires. So, thank you. Thank you. Can we go uh, a, few, a few comments on my part. Uh, first off, just a, kind of an observation, and I, I don't mean to, you know, uh, throw shade on anybody, but you know, there's a second small area in a plan in a row. We've had a project come in in the process that seems to kind of start shaping the small area plan. Um, I understand timing and that's the way life works, but it makes me really uncomfortable to see that happening because it seems like we're starting to conform our small area plans around. <laughs> I'm not speaking as to the merits of, of the proposals. I'm just saying about the, the sequencing makes me uncomfortable. Um, 
two specific things with the plan. Um, one, there's a mention of a branding and the implementation. I'm not aware that we have branding in any other area of Edina. Um, I think that's probably a little, something probably needs to be thought out on a, on a citywide basis if we're gonna go that, rather than just instituting it for this specific area. Um, I would also suggest that the, 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 the call out to do further study on the um, industrial commercial areas be included in the overall plan we proposed out of the economic competitiveness chapter to do a study of the broader commercial industrial areas of, of Edina, as opposed to doing a one-off, just incorporate that in that broader study. Um, that, those are my two specific comments. My, my final overall comment is I'm struggling with this. I, it seems like it goes from, it, there's a part missing in the middle. It goes from here's an area that clearly could use some redevelopment to Here's this village. This, it's a. It, it's not. You almost need a master redeveloper to come in and, and move all these properties around and get all this infrastructure. And as I've looked back against and compared to some of the other small area plans, you could definitely kind of see the steps of how you get to that vision of this is this property is going to do this. I think you know um, Wooddale's uh, would be a good example of that. We certainly have seen that in at 44th in France. To me, though, it, this is so ambitious, I don't know where that middle is, and I don't know what gets you along the path to realizing that vision. It kind of goes from, as I said, from the conditions we have now to this vision, which is a, a wonderful village. I think it'd be incredible if you could pull it off. I just don't know how you get there from here, considering there's so many properties, so many parcels, different motives, different financial incentives. It just to me, it, that's a real struggle. And the am ambition makes it a, kind of a challenging plan in my mind. But that's my personal opinion. Um, but it, it's a, I think that's you know where that middle is and how you get there and get the things that people want is, 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 is the challenge. And I don't know how, that, how this directs me to doing it. There's a lot of steps involved in implementation. I don't know how any of those lead specifically to getting that redevelopment accomplished that will create the restaurants and allow the redevelopment and you know, the affordable housing and all of that. Thank you. Um, you got comments? Commissioner Amaroff. If we're going down the line, I'm next in line. Do you? Tell me. Okay. Um, I thought you did a nice job. Obviously, been working for a year. I have a variety of comments. Um, height and density, obviously, are two of the biggest issues. Uh, I, I guess I would just at the end of the day, I would say I would do it differently than it's being done here. And I suspect that there's some things that, are, that could happen the way it's defined in this plan that the work group would not like. However, by analogy, it kind of feels like something where you're, you've got a, a sales team and you've told them to sell a product to a customer and, and uh, but they have to get the sale done. And then you go to the customer and the customer wants to pay you 25,000 and your boss wants 75,000 and you strike a deal at 60 and you had to get the deal done and it just, that's how you got your results. And I guess that's how, the, that's kind of how this heightened density feels to me. And you know, that's a fair way to do it. There is no scientific way to do it. Again, I would do it differently, but it's based on my understanding how this process worked. I will support how this work group came to its conclusion on the heightened density. Um, a few things that uh, I wanna also comment on. There's been, uh, attorney and she said to me she said yeah you know I'm dealing with people in prison but you're dealing with affordable housing you're really doing something I mean it's really it's re affordable housing is really getting people everywhere I mean it's a really challenging thing for people to deal with people are in favor of it but then they're the same person can be a favor of it and against it and I think it's a real challenge for communities and individuals um, I think one of the things that comes up on affordable housing is sometimes people have a person in their mind about who will be living in affordable housing and depending on who you envision in your mind can shape how you feel about any particular affordable housing project. I have a, I have a pro bono client that really has gone through some, you know, had some bad things happen to her. She's a teacher and, you know, she didn't have, she couldn't find affordable housing right now. I don't know where she would be. I mean, you know, it's just, it was, 100% out of her control that these things happen to her in her life. And she's in affordable housing with her, trying to raise her kid while she's teaching and rebuilding her life. And 
I don't, you know, I think, I think that's a lot of who goes to affordable housing. I think other people have other profiles in mind, and I think we ought to think about that, who, who's going to live there. I think that shapes how we all perceive the value of affordable housing in our, in our society. Um, one comment about affordable housing that came up in written materials that were submitted to us before this meeting and came up tonight that I, I do think we want to clarify, um, that the affordable housing is a citywide thing. I know everyone's focused on this property and they feel like, of the city's entire goal is to put all affordable housing in this district. And I, I know why people feel that way, because you live near here and you're most focused on that. You're most attuned to what's going on in, in this area. But I, I, I assure you that there are affordable housing projects going on, projects not the right word, but affordable housing activities going on throughout the city of Edina right as we speak. And it isn't something that we're just saying, Sebi think Cahill will be the affordable housing area. That, that is not the case. Um, a couple other things, branding, uh, not a big deal. I mean, I, I, I think the branding is a great idea. Actually, there are other districts within Edina do have brands. We have Saltdale has a nationally known brand. 50th in France has a strong regional brand. I, I think if, uh, if the choice is to call it 70th in Cahill or Cahill Village and people there want to call it Cahill Village, I, I think that's awesome. You know, I, I, Oh, great. Um, a couple other things that I would do. Uh, I would remove the archaeological stuff. I, I think phase one archaeological survey, phase two archaeological survey uh, have official, those are, those are defined terms. You look at the Minnesota state archaeologist, those are things that are intended to lead to placement of, of properties on the National Historic Register. I did not gather from the feedback I got that that's the intent. If the intent is to just get the historical flavor of the area and incorporate that into the branding of the district and the development, I think that's great. But I, I would not do a, I would not mandate phase one archaeological studies, phase two archaeological studies for developments. That's just that's just creating a bureaucratic process that can affect the value of people's property. Um, also, I think the idea of doing a study of the industrial office park to the south of 70th and Cahill is an, is an outstanding idea. That's, that's an that's a area that, it's, it's of value to the city today, but of all the areas in Edina, that is the closest to take a blank sheet of paper and envision what the future could be. And I, I think some of the, the language that I read in this draft and some of the conversation I've had have already prejudged the outcome of that study to being basically trying to refresh the existing buildings and put sidewalks there, which I don't think, I don't think that we've done enough looking at that to say that that is the desired outcome. I think that looking at it and, and having a fresh set of uh, citizens review it and let, their, let them brainstorm to the, what the best use, and that could be the best use, but I wouldn't prejudge that today before letting another group of citizens decide. So, um, those are my comments. I really appreciate all the, the feedback that people gave. Um, it, it's, it, it, it was surprisingly uh, pleasant to see all the passion that, and care that people have for this district. And um, I think the work group did a pretty nice job to try to balance a lot of things and take a lot of work. Obviously, if, you, if we could have brought in a New York consultant and... Uh, uh, who's a specialist, and, you know, we might have come up with a different result, but I think that the people that did this did a good job, and I really appreciate the work you did and, and all the citizens that participate in the work group. Thank you for all your volunteer participation. Sure. Um, so I, I also would like to thank the work group because they seem to have done a really great job with the situation they were given. I mean, there's a lot of opposing sides and conflicts and um, considerations that need to be taken into account. Um, I think my comment is just saying that the future really is coming to Edina, whether we like it or not. And I think that this plan really embraces that. And I think as a community, kind of working towards this um, better future for Edina is part of this plan as well. So, yeah. Commissioner Bennett. Woo. All right. 
So I, I have probably way more things to say than I'm intending to, so I apologize in advance. Uh, but first off, uh, myself and Sheila, we uh, co-led a previous small area plan in 44th and France, so we know firsthand all of the effort that went into it by the leaders as well as the working group and all of you here. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for being here and all of your participation up to this point. Um, it might not feel like it at the time, but we are residents just like you, passionate about a place that we hold dear to our hearts. So, you know, all the comments and details you share, they're important and they shape our opinions. And we hope to get to whatever this is. Hopefully it's the best compromise and provides the best outlook for Edina's future, all things considered. So. That's my first plug to you, so thanks for being here. Um, for, first thing I'd like to talk about is kind of addressing the why. I think Commissioner Hamilton talked about it, and I don't, I don't need to go on and on about it, but just simply um, how we see our city and how the leadership sees it is not to transform Edina into this urban center, um, keep the single-family neighborhoods the same, but just provide enhancements to our neighborhood nodes that can be deemed urbanized. You know, we want something more walkable, more connected, more modes of transportation. Those things are urbanization, but living in a neighborhood, I would definitely like to get to a neighborhood node more efficiently and safely, and those things are the things that we're trying to make happen. And so this node being a little more urbanized, however you want to take it, it's the node, not the surrounding neighborhood. And that's what I at least gathered from the small area plan in the process is it is just the small area. And uh, there was consideration of the transitions. If you look at some of the plans and language, um, they learned a lot from kind of what we went through on 44th and France with a very vocal group of um, neighbors as well. Transitions are very big, so they at least started off on a really good foot with that, and you see that in the plan, respecting how whatever that height and density might look like or feel like, that it is appropriate as it blends down into their neighborhood. I don't know what that looks like in the future, but it speaks to it and it addresses that, so hopefully future development, you know, I mean, it's very visible and we'll at least be able to hold them accountable using that as a tool. Uh, <clears throat> a couple other things I'd have to say, not necessarily amendments uh, recommended to the plan, granted the items brought up from uh, the woman at Excel, kind of piggyback at, onto the questions I had earlier on. Um, but one thing that we looked at um, at 44th and France, and I see here too, and it's maybe more just words of uh, encouragement as to how to implement this plan effectively. Yeah, it's this paper document, but what can you as a community and we as a commission do to start spurring some change? And for us, uh, there are definitely some things the city can do, right? We, the city, we, we own property here. There is that that green space that the bike trail goes on. There are the roadways. Those are the things that we can influence a lot more than we can influence private properties. So I would encourage if there are things hinging on any of those changes that you, we push those hard. Um, 44th in France, more than this plan, to really get it to fruition and to achieve the dreams we have for it, there is a very specific push for the city to do something. And I don't think we realized it until some proposals came in that didn't necessarily address that. So I don't see that here, but there are a couple things that I just want to bring up. So the bike trail, that is something that exists now and is a huge asset. So whatever you can do or we can do to get that bike trail, because it is under current consideration to make a connection south to the Bush Lake area. Um, it looks like it goes on 70th down Cahill. We all know that wouldn't be the best option. And what this kind of addresses is an alternative to wind that trail right through that area. So if that's not in this plan, I'd, I'd really encourage to focus on that, and at least from a city perspective, to get with the particular stakeholders to 
drive that home because if you do bike on the trail, there aren't a lot of great places to stop and hang out um, like this. And this, that in itself could really help revitalize this area a lot. So really focus on that. Um, it looks like it's a sensible location um, for whatever type of housing is nearby there would, that would help supplement that. And then the next thing is um, that crossover on the tracks. It, it seems like a logistical nightmare right now and super, super, super expensive because it'd be the city's undertaking, the railroad won't pay for that. Um, and it's, I don't know why XL would pay for any of that. So if this plan doesn't address that, um, at least it should provide guidance as to how to, how to make that happen because it seems like what is proposed is just not practical. So we should adjust that before that goes through or at least provide language like here's a concept, but move it south 100 feet and then it's better. And um, that's about it that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila, do you have any comments? Yeah, just a few quick comments. Um, first of all, congratulations on finishing a really well done project. And we know it takes a ton of time and there are a lot of emotions involved. But from the looks of it, there was some healthy compromise. And I totally respect you know, that there are some dissenting views, and I'm pleased that we heard those thoughts too. So thank you for, um, for your efforts, and congratulations on finishing up. Um, second, I, I, I just wanted to, you know, we heard John's comments. Um, I think they're really valuable and important to remember we're not setting out plans to increase density in Edina, we're seeing what's coming and trying to be proactive and make the best of it. So I think that's really important. Um, in that context, I will say the first time I read this, I was a bit surprised that there wasn't more density because this is an area in Edina, unlike most areas, where <clears throat> And though the land is being used, it seemed like it had great opportunity for improvement. And any place where you can put density of anywhere in Edina, it seems like this would be a great opportunity to really make something beautiful and more dense. As I've thought about it, though, I realize the way it's positioned, traffic would likely be an issue. And that's a concern. Um, you're a little further away from freeways than other places, and there are fewer, you know, four-lane streets around there. And so I completely appreciate the traffic issues. Um, hopefully down the road we'll have more public transportation options. Who knows? Hard to imagine that within 10 years, but it's something you know we can maybe look forward to, but I would be cautious about putting huge density in this area before we have that infrastructure. Um, I wanted to make a comment on the schools. I have heard, and, and I don't know what the exact number is, but I, I have heard it's some, something in the double digits um, where we have the open enrollment. So there's people from other school districts attending Edina schools with the open enrollment. And it's some double digit percentage. So my understanding is that's the buffer. It's that double digit that will accommodate the potential for more students coming into Edina because they'll just reject the open enrollment students in favor of Edina residents, right? So if that's the case, and today we feel like the schools are overcrowded. I would posit that's, that's the strategy of the schools. That's not a population issue. And so if you have an issue with that, that's less about too many kids in Edina and more about how the schools are structured. Because we have a buffer. We have a double digit number that's open enrollment. So that's maybe something to think about 
and to not let that fear get in the way of density because we do have that buffer. Um, those are my major comments. So I'll stop there. I think most of the other things I was going to say have been already said. So um, thanks for your work on this, and thanks for your participation. Lou? Thank you. Um, uh, first, I'd like to actually um, address something that was brought up, that was brought up here um, about having a new project uh, sort of half planned before the uh, Small area plan is complete. Now, I, along with um, uh, Sheila and uh, uh, <laughs> Jeremy, I, <laughs> um, I worked on the 44th and France small area plan. Um, I, as a resident, I wasn't on the planning commission at the time. Um, and in that case, and in fact, I wrote a letter, uh, co wrote a letter to the city council asking them not to allow that development to happen. Um, and that's because, you know, in these, in these small areas, we're getting a lot of push from developers to have new development. So we wanted to, to push that back until we had a good idea as, of a community as what we wanted. But we, we, what we have here is something different. We have an opportunity for affordable housing, which is not something that is usually forced down our throats that we have to push back again. It's something we actually have to actively work for. And it's something that's um, in a lot of ways difficult to get. It's difficult to get financing. Um, they have to go through years of work to try to get a project in here. And the other thing about it is that you don't want affordable housing anywhere. You want it in a place where there's already some, some density and you want to build up more density. You want it a place that's near uh, parks, a place that's wa walkable, that's bikeable. You can get to or that has transit, places that you know, you can live without a car because people who are struggling to afford housing are probably struggling to afford, you know, they're not going to have two or three cars, right? They're going to have fewer cars. So, you know, it's rare that we get this kind of, you know, multiple things happening at the same time. So I think, I think we need to encourage that here. Um, uh, second thing I'd like to point out is that, you know, um, we have a difficult job on the Planning Commission. I think we'll all agree that. We, do, we don't like angry people staring at us. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes that means going against what the majority is saying it wants. So, for example, in this particular project, I was really stunned when I first got a copy of this. And I saw that the, the centerpiece of the whole thing was the Nine Mile Creek Trail. Because we had, you know, the city had a huge pushback on that and, you know, Groups organized to protest it, and there was huge pushback on that. And now I think most people agree it's you know a gem in the city. It's a wonderful trail to, to walk and bike on. So sometimes you know we have the difficult job of pushing something through that maybe people don't think they want. Um, so addressing traffic and congestion, which is a big issue, is a big issue of 44th in France. I think it's pretty much a big issue throughout the city. Um, just as Carrie said, I mean, part of it is how you think about things, right? And, and how thoroughly are things thought through? So just as Carrie was talking about the school district saying that, you know, they're only getting 0.1 student per unit. You know, you're not, you, it's not a single family home. You're not going to have three kids moving in per unit, right? So as a single family homeowner, we tend to think about, you know, these people are like us. They're, their family is the same size of us. They own the same sort of things that we own. You know, so if, in terms of traffic and congestion, if you're moving into an apartment, you probably wouldn't have three or four cars. You wouldn't have a three, four car garage the way you do with a house, right? So <clears throat> the number of cars coming in here is not going to be commensurate with building, you know, if you build 100 apartments, it's not the same thing as building 100 houses with three and four car garages, right? You're going to have a much fewer cars moving in. You're going to have more cars, but it's not going to be as many as you think. Um, Let's see. So um, this is a neighborhood node, right? This is not, we have different kinds of nodes, and we have commercial nodes and neighborhood nodes, and we have the Southdale district, which is huge. So we don't want a business, we don't want Target here, right? We don't want Walmart here. We don't want a big, big box business. We want smaller businesses that appeal to the community, coffee shops, restaurants, you know, maybe a bike shop, something like that. So these are businesses that are small, so you want people from the neighborhood to come here. And if you live in this neighborhood, you could probably walk or bike there because it's so close to where you live, right? So 
again, you're not going to generate the kind of traffic you would as if you had this huge parking lot and it's a target and people coming from 10 miles around to go to target. So we want that kind of development in a neighborhood node. Um, another thing about moving around within a node, we want, uh, you know, what you build is what people will do, right? So if you make something safe and comfortable, that's what people are going to do. If you build a lot of roads, you build a lot of parking, and it's free parking, people are going to drive, and they're going to park there, right? That's because it's the easiest thing to do. It's the safest thing to do. Um, so we need to, I mean, we talk about traffic studies and level of service, you know, for cars. What about level of service for transit, level of service for walking, level of service for biking, right? How efficient, how comfortable is it, right? You can't just put a bike lane. There's a bike lane on 70th, right? How many people bike on that bike lane? Do you feel really comfortable biking on that bike lane? Oh, we have somebody in the back biking on the bike lane. Great. That's wonderful. But really, you know, there's different kinds of cyclists and, and you know, the power cyclists are going to bike on there. But somebody who's, you know, one of the first things that happened to me when I joined the commission was I had a friend who just moved here and, and they have two little kids and they had one of those little towed up bike things on the back for the kids. And I took them along Wooddale thinking, oh, this is a great, you know, bikeable area. And it's like, now that I see somebody with a kid behind them on a street like that with an unprotected bike lane, you know, it's like, that's not the greatest thing. So we need to think about how, you know, comfort and safety for pedestrians and cyclists and people who take transit. Um, uh, the final thing I'd like to say is that, you know, there's been some discussion about the, the street across the railroad, and I think that, um, as I said in our, uh, you know, earlier, dis our working plan, our working group discussion, yeah, um, that I think, I think it's a great idea, I think as a bike and pedestrian thing, it's not only cheaper to do, but it also encourages, again, this whole neighborhood thing, you're going to get people walking and biking between there, you're going to people in your neighborhood walking to the, to the brewery that's there now, right? If you put in a street with turn lanes, you know, and you're just gonna encourage people to drive there instead of walk there, right? So that's just gonna encourage more traffic. If you put a street in there, people are gonna use it as a cut through, right? They're not gonna, I mean, they don't care about the neighborhood, right? They wanna get from 100 to 70th Street. They're gonna cut through there. So I think, you know, the more we, you know, People use what you build, and if you build something that's more pedestrian and bicycle oriented, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. So that's my final comment. Thanks. Well, of course, Todd leaves the room when I'm gonna kinda push back a little bit on what he said, which is kinda what you brought up too, Lou, was these are areas, they, they were identified as areas of potential change, so we knew that there's always gonna be development proposals there, so. I'm not that concerned that, you know, as these studies were happening, that development proposals were coming forward. That's just exactly what like John Hamilton was just saying too. It's, it's, it's what's gonna happen. These are prime areas for redevelopment. So we are gonna see that. So I'm not, you know, concerned or find some, you know, like conspiracy or anything on that and here he comes. So I, I disagree with what he, uh, Todd Thorson said. <laughs> but um, because, so I think this is exactly why we're, you know, creating these small area plans is because we are seeing these potential developments and of course they're gonna be happening during it or before or after, so. Um, I just, I think it just emphasizes exactly we're doing the right thing. Um, Urban, Jimmy um, covered that too. Uh, you know, it's not that we're talking all these big towers, we're talking about making it walkable and having transit and making it, you know, pedestrian friendly or, you know, just places to go hang out. So urban, I think is a, actually, it's a good thing to achieve. Um, so as far as this plan too, I'm also, you know, I keep, I'm going back, I keep reading the implementation section and I think that some steps have been set to achieve this and um, it definitely is gonna, you know, involve, like again, what Jimmy said to public, you know, the, the city being involved in jump starting, but I think you set up some good um, steps that will, you know, lead us to that. I don't think there's a big gap in between. Um, my only concern, one of my concerns, again, I think I mentioned that, is being very, 
you know, this is how it is. And when we get the, you know, proposals for, you know, not being exactly as that, I think we do need to be a little bit more clear um, on what to do when that happens. Maybe allow a little bit of flexibility with that or think about some additional items you might want to achieve. Again, going back to that public realm or there's a lot there that we could get. I just said it. Um, and then the other thing is also just about the TIF pieces, you know, f working on that language. And, um, but otherwise, I think it's a, it's a great plan. You did, you know, all of these are the same. They're, they're really, they're hard. There's a lot of different opinions, and it impacts a lot of people. But I think you all did a great job. I don't know if I'm staring at all the other, you know, work group members out there. But thank you. Jimmy, do you have something before that? I have just a couple comments before John chimes in. Um, the last one speaks to your last point, but I did forget to mention traffic too. And certainly if, if things are recognized and there's a need for some improvement infrastructure wise, like that's something, you know, residents can put pressure on the city to study. Like if that intersection backs up so much that whatever needs to change with it, like we got to make sure that it's safe and that that intersection functions. So if they didn't discover that in their, in their traffic study, which is what we were informed of, um, certainly more pressure on that can fix that situation. Because I mean, obviously if that's backed up, no matter what changes in this area, that whole area doesn't function as well. So we'd want that to be cleared up anyways. Um, last point, to kind of speak to the flexibility in some of the language, um, how this plan differs from ours in 44th and France is we put some conditions if a proposal were to come that exceeded some of the requirements, the zoning, for instance, that's in there. If it's that we didn't put a limit on density because density can come in so many different shapes and sizes, you could have an affordable small building that has a bunch of small apartments or small units that has a lot of density, but, you know, it doesn't seem like it's more than 50, but it is. So we elected to not have that. And if, if someone was um, above the minimum required in the zoning as well for this, the, the height limit, um, regardless, and our height limit was two stories, if they were above that, and even though we guided the area to accommodate three or ours was three to four stories. If they were above that too, they'd have to come to us for a sketch plan as well as a variance you know, request. So then we would get to make sure that this plan was really upheld. Um, I guess the danger with being super specific and implementing that and saying this is what we want, we all know the development community will do the bare minimum. And if they, if they can persuade the staff and other people that, yeah, hey, this is met. We don't see it, and likely you guys might not be able to comment on that either. So that that was the impetus of um, Planner Teague adding that amendment language. And maybe you could speak, because I didn't, I w we weren't involved after that meeting with how it was developed, but maybe you could speak to what we were wanting for that flexibility to mo more protect the area, not allow crazy new development? Yeah, certainly, so I'll start with the height. As the plan is written today, we would amend the height overlay district to allow five stories on that site, allow three stories by right. So if a developer wanted to come in and do three stories, they get to do that um, as a matter of by right. So the, the language that I was suggesting is the height overlay district stands today if somebody wants to go taller similar to the language from the 44th plan um, they would have to do so through a site plan through a variance through potentially rezoning and they and we would evaluate the objectives in the land use section in, in within the small area plan and the planning commission makes recommendations to the city council 
have they done enough to justify that increase in height? So that, that's what the language um, is suggesting. Rather than just by right, changing the zoning ordinance to allow um, the height that's suggested here. In terms of the density that, that you had asked about in regard to the affordable housing project, um, again, it's flexibility language that 50 is still the max, but if a project had um, a minimum of 20% of the units within the project um, be for affordable housing, that they could go up to 90 units an acre. And where I came up with the 90 units an acre was taking a five-story building on the on the site that would allow five stories um, and just playing that out. So whether 90 is the exact number, I guess that's that's for you to consider. It could be um, slightly lower, but up anyway, above above 50. Um, so that's that's how I came up with that 90 number. Uh, but this would allow again, through a rezoning action, the city still has the discretion to allow density over the, the 50 units an acre, even up to 50 units an acre through the rezoning process. If the plan gets adopted at a hard cap of 50, you know, it takes an amendment to the comprehensive plan. You know, it's that additional step to the Met Council for a project that comes in with a density over 50 units an acre. So again, this is um, encouraging the affordable housing piece. Good question. I'm kind of going blank on it. So the you wouldn't be changing your amendment. You wouldn't be stating that it goes three to three stories to five stories. It would be the existing. Is that what we've done with the other ones? Is that what we're doing? Yes, the okay. existing zoning, the height overlay map stays in place. Mm -hmm. If a developer comes in and wants to go over that, you know, it's negotiated through that site plan review, through a variance, um, and or and or rezoning. But then we would still be using this guidance to say we would. If you're going to do that, this is what we'd want to see. Yep. Could be requiring connections to the side to the um, to the bike trail, um, enhancing pedestrian crossings you know there was a um, that one map that that um, commissioner lee showed that intersection of 70th as it comes into amundsen you know doing some improvements there to um, help pedestrian safety those were some of the things that that we could ask for in exchange for that height so um just to think about so substantively i think like carrie what you're suggesting has a lot of good thought behind it. My concern with that is procedurally, though, is, um, is as we've heard, the work group has been working hard, and they've reached something that was a tough compromise. And this is a core part of their compromise to produce a small area plan. So if, would these changes, should these proposed changes go back in front of the work group, or are they things that we would just do uh, we would set aside the work group's decision, and I'm just kind of wondering how the process works. So we'd come up with our own opinion, decision on that? Yeah, procedurally, it's up to you. Um, the way we've kind of generally talked about how these are, are operating, the work group puts together their plan. They make the recommendation to the city council, or to the planning commission first. It's up to you to make amendments. Um, your recommendations, ultimately it's the city council that's going to approve the plan. So if you're to suggest adopting some flexibility language or whatever changes that you proposed, it would the, um, the plan as drafted by the work group goes to the city council and there would be an addendum to whatever changes that you're proposing. So they would consider both the work group's plan and the changes that, that you are, are recommending. I just want to respond to that. Um, it, it, first of all, in, in respect to the 44th and France uh, plan, um, that give to the get language was 
first referred to as compromise language, and my understanding was the work group could not come to an agreement on height for that area, and so they elected to leave it as is, but inserted the provision to allow greater height if certain conditions were met. I think the difference is the work group was unified on this height recommendation, and they are comfortable with changing the height overlay uh, plan to accommodate greater height with the expectation that the city honor it, that this is the requirement, as well as all the other public realm improvements, which are noted in the site guidelines and the building type guidelines. They're very specific. So these are the things that, uh, just as we talked about as the, the Southdale plan, these are the things that would be handed to the developer and says, have at it. This is what we're looking for. So there should not be this issue of, hmm, well, if they want to go higher, then we can ask them for, for that public realm. It is in the plan, and again, I will say, that it is always there. We're not taking, the intent is not to take away any action uh, or tool available to the Planning Commission or City Council that doesn't exist today. At any point, they can look at it and say, well, but we feel this merits, this is special, this merits a greater density. Yes, it will require a comp plan amendment, but I am confident there is enough range in the plan to accommodate some really good design and really good projects. So I think it really comes down to that the Planning Commission and the City Council need to be confident that what the work group landed on is in fact workable and to use that as a guide and see what comes forth. It can always be amended or changed later. However, if this plan goes with the amendment, then I, I do have one suggestion and that is that language belongs in the comp plan, the greater comp plan. It is not specific to this. It should address how the Planning Commission and the City Council can go for greater height or density or exceed whatever they want to call it, the small area plans. But that is a universal concept. And if it's specifically about affordable housing, then it needs to be in the affordable housing portion of the housing chapter on affordability. We will allow X, or we will consider this when a development comes up, not in these small individual, uh, small area plans. So I say that again because, again, this is going to change the essence of what the understanding of our work group was. They agreed to these specific ranges in height and density. And I wouldn't say they agreed. We agreed. That was the consensus because, again, there's individuals' opinions and did we test it? Yes, we did test it in terms of the number of density and the height. I'm just going to respond quickly. Um, at least for the 44th and France small area plan, um, we got to a similar place um, as your plan did. We, we did compromise on what the heights were going to be guided to and even mapped it out. What we were aware of was if we left the height overlay district the same, um, even if a developer wanted to build something to the stories we were guiding to, it'd still have to go through this sketch plan and uh, a variance you know, request process. So what it would look different as is if your plan were accepted and then that went through and the zoning was changed, if say the developer that brought forth a 4400 France project, um, we wouldn't have seen the sketch plan proposal. We wouldn't have seen the variance request. It would have by right been approved because they met the guidance. But as we know, through that process, we were able to shape it. The community was able to weigh into it and there was a back and forth. So this adds that extra layer, even though um, you're guiding it to something, the zoning can still say lower. It, we may not see that, and I do want to get the facts on that. I think we still get a review, right? You do. And if they wanted a sketch plan review, we'd still get a review, regardless of whether it's, it requires a variance or not. Yeah, well, sketch we plan only generally always see sketch plans with rezoning. 
Um, with site plan reviews, it's most of the time we do, but not okay. always. Okay, so there is a, a certain element of where it would come to the planning mission. But outside of that, it's really a tool for the city. It's looking at the t city side and saying, this is your document, this is what you work from, this is what you got it, and hopefully by the, it, it shouldn't have to come to us because it's all built in there already. There's no reason to ask us for a variance. There's no reason to say we have to give something to get something or, or get something to give something. Um, it, it is in the plan, it's clear. This was how the Wooddale Valley View plan was. We did not uh, write in any, any type of language to allow flexibility. The flexibility has come about through the, the past few years because we've been getting these proposals that totally don't meet our zoning. We, we've acknowledged the zoning is, is somewhat outdated and so we've been going to the comp plan review process over to Met Council endlessly. This is our chance to rezone it to get what we believe will hold for the next decade or, or further and hold to it as a city, which is what the principle of planning is about. If you come to an agreement on the plan, now you enforce it. We are after a plan that is enforceable. Obviously, we recognize there are times where you're going to have to deviate. And as I said, that is the mechanism we've been using, comp plan amendment, um, a variance request before the Planning Commission onto the Council. So it's not any different than what it is, except that this group has agreed to what they believe to be the plan uh, for the small area. Well, I, I think there might be two types of properties that people are thinking about. One is properties that exceed five stories. And I think that this discussion has probably been pretty applicable to that. But I think that there's another set of properties that people are concerned about also, which is, I believe that current, and, and Carrie, please correct me if I'm wrong, but current zoning in this area is less than five stories. Is that, is that correct? That's the correct. The zoning limit is the three stories or four stories. Two stories. Two stories. Two stories for the commercial and piece. And so if someone wanted to go from two stories to five stories, they'd have to get a variance and come before the planning commission. And is there a concern that as drafted, this plan would change that and would remove the two-story limit from zoning and make all the two-story limits to five stories. So anyone that wanted to build five stories under this plan could do it without a variance. Is yeah. that the concern? That is the concern. It, it's not five stories over the whole district. There are but some whatever the story. district, Right, right. And, and, and then I guess, Sue, Jerry, is, the question for you is, is that what the work group intended? Did they intend that people could build up to five stories without a variance? Yes, their understanding is we are changing the zoning to accommodate greater height and greater density. This is what we could potentially see. I think that's what you, what you see that's palpable because when residents hear that, when stakeholders, they, they instantly go to the, well, at 100% full build out and it's gonna to happen tomorrow, but it's not. And you may get a two story building on the five story eligible parcel. We don't know what the market forces are, but it's simply identifying where we do want lower height, where we could take a little more height and a density range we're comfortable with. And again, the density doesn't even come into play if they don't even build residential. So uh, all those numbers are, are such a guess. But yes, the work group understood that. And it was about actually changing the zoning, calling it neighborhood node and changing the height and density. So I, I have a follow-up question then, perhaps as much for Carrie as for anyone then. So I assume that there are setback requirements in this district too. If, if a property came in that met the height requirements and met the density requirements but did not meet the setback requirements of the zoning ordinance, would that require a variance? That would, yep. Okay, all right, thanks, Carrie. But just for the setback, right? So, so I guess, you know, our concern with it is, and by our, I just mean myself and whoever might side with how we went about the 44th in France was, you know, we tried to make it clear and like say you have it clear and that's what we want to push forward, but we can make this change to add an extra level of discretion for us during the process. That's all it's doing. It's allowing us to have more discretion. So, because again, the development community, how they're gonna look at this plan is way different than us. It's not going to be as robust. 
It's not going to have as much public realm. We can legally have more discretion in that decision if they're even doing something that meets that guidance. But if they come in and it's five stories, meets the setbacks, everything's good, we can't say anything even though we think it doesn't meet it at all. So we lose discretion and that's just this little tweak. It doesn't change the plan and it doesn't change support. It pushes it through but it allows us to have more control legally. That's all that I see. I'm not trying to promote this freedom to do something bigger. It's just it provides another layer for us to and the community to chime in. Is that correct? I would agree with that, yes. I think there there is just as much discretion for the city to say what in their site design and public realm design guidelines for for the area. So if there is going to be a, a sidewalk that crosses their parcel or if the parcel abuts uh, one of the interior streets, the plan is clear what hap what those even what those dimensions are. It, it, it has to match that. And the document says that a site design guideline is every bit as enforceable as a building height guideline or a density guideline. If it doesn't exist in our current zoning, then we need to put it there. I don't know if there's additional language that we have to say, refer to this document, it's in there, or it will adhere to the small area, 70th and Cahill small area plan, but that's the intent, that all public realm improvements must abide by the small area plan. So it is enforceable in as much as a building height overlay diagram or a density range. I do, well, that would be, a, I'd have to study that a little closer depending on the specifics, you know, the creating additional parkland. The city would have to buy that. Um, but let's say one of the south retail parcels is redeveloping and they needed a setback variance. We couldn't, and, and they were building to four stories that met our height requirement. We couldn't require them to put sidewalk improvements a block away. We might be able to leverage them to do that through a rezoning or three, through, the, um, through a variance process. It, again, it gives us more discretion to get some of those public improvements that we might not be able to get through a standard site plan or variance review. Okay, I see, I see the point you're making. I would agree with that. However, I also think that in some respects there was an expectation that the city step up to the plate, that yes, there are some improvements here that might not always be negotiable or only obtainable or should be looked at as only attainable through the developer. And that is certainly something that can be done through the capital improvements plan, the, the city making um, capital investments in those public realm improvements, yes. I guess an example, if something were to come through without, or if this goes in as drafted and say someone's building something five stories in a place that's guided for it, it meets all the requirements, the zoning, it, is there a public hearing for that at all? There is. Tearing down a building, rebuilding, or and adding that, on to But that's just an, in front of the council? No, that's planning it's commission planning as well. planning commission too. Yep. And, Yeah. If they meet all of our site plan, all of our requirements, we have very little, well, we can't really turn that down. We can add certain conditions like putting in landscaping, screening, um, enclosing trash enclosures, things like, things like that. I guess that's just what, if, if we have the option right now, to me it just seems like if we can insert that, Again, I feel like the development community, you can write these requirements, you can visualize them, but they're going to do the bare minimum. And we've seen it every time. We've never seen a sketch plan come in and like, wow, that's perfect, you're good. We have a lot of things to provide discretion on of whether we accept that or not. And if we have a choice right now to make that, I recommend we do so. I think we don't, the reason we don't see it is because we don't have these plans in place that are, have site-specific guidelines. Again, building-type guidelines. It's in this plan. 
So um, that when you say that we haven't seen that, I think that in some ways we're used to that process, but we're operating under an assumption of zoning that requires um, a variance. So we're operating on the old comp plan. We are updating the comp plan now. The purpose is to create these small area plans that are current will carry us for the next 10 years. I also want to say that I think that there's a little, little bit of mistrust in how the Planning Commission and the City Council decides to exercise that flexibility. We feel we're doing the right thing, but it's that variability that residents feel that they, they can't count on, that, that it's not somehow addressing what the plan is. Our excuse in the past has been, well, there was no plan, or it, clearly we can't just stick with two-story here. We're not going to get any development. Edina moves forward. We have a chance, and we have done it here, to create a plan that will carry us for the next 10 years. That was our charge. So to me, it only makes sense that we would honor that plan, say, that is the plan, and this flexibility we talk about, you always, we always have that right, right? We always have that right to say, uh, we, we expect, we will, we will go over the limit. We will have a six-story building there. It's just gonna require a comp plan amendment. And hopefully there'll be way fewer comp plan amendments because this plan has vetted the range, the two, time, two to three times increase in height and the five-fold in density that we are allowing for growth in this for over what's the current zoning. So let's, let's adopt the plan and exercise it and trust that it is a good plan. And any flexibility language that there needs to be should live in the greater comp plan, not as an amendment to this. So last thing. So what I believe with that flexibility language is it doesn't change the fact it's a good plan. It honors and requires everything that's in the plan still. It just allows discretion after whoever proposes something feels that they meet all the requirements in the plan. It just adds an extra level of discretion that we would otherwise not have. That's it. That's, that's all that I'm seeing. It's not saying you can not meet the requirements of the plan. It is you still have to do everything in here. It's just we have more discretion on whether they did it to the right degree. I think it's, le I would phrase it not as discretion, but as leverage. Um, I mean, I want leverage and power. I mean, that's what we're trying to get. And I think by amending that language, we retain the leverage to get what we want. And having read these guidelines and knowing the creativity of the developer community, if we put really explicit things down, they are gonna find a way to, to do it the cheapest way possible. I mean, and as well thought as these are, they're gonna find a way. So we need to make sure we are maintaining our leverage as a community to make sure we're getting the quality of projects we want. We just cannot give them the, the free pass to get past all that. Yeah, and I think the, you know, focusing so much on the, on the height and density that way is winning the battle but losing the war. And so that you're, you're winning the battle of getting absolute numbers for height and density, but then you're losing the war of you know, having a livable neighborhood that, um, because this is a plan, it's not an implementation, right? So as far as I know, this isn't all codified in city law, right? I mean, this is what the, the community wants, but they don't have to build everything that's in here, do they? It, if they beat the- It will be codified if the plan gets accepted. Everything in here? I mean, yeah. everything about you know, how well, building massing and everything? I mean, how that works. I'm guessing not. But. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Everything in the plan gets codified. Because it, I mean, we have height regulations, setback regulations. We can't, I mean, in terms of that public realm, we can't mandate that unless the city steps up and purchases property, puts it in the capital improvement. That's not zoning, that's a separate city council action for the CIP to do public improvements in this district. This is a way of leveraging um, the development community to provide those things for the city. Right, so for example, I mean, there's the, the Woonerf and the 
walkability and the sidewalks and stuff. If, a develop, if, if we say they can build three to five stories and they build five stories, they don't have to do the WUNOR for any of that stuff, right? Correct. Yeah. Right. So I think you know, you're, lo you're winning a battle, but we're losing a war. In some ways, the city does have to commit to some of these things. If we only hope for development to move forward for the change that we want, then we are beholden to developers. Because if that proposal never comes forward, then that won't, owner won't come. So it's a matter of prioritizing. And I do believe that the city does have to include some of this stuff in the CIP. Maybe that owner is part of it. But certainly, the site design guidelines, carry. I know that other communities do have these in their, it lives in their zoning, or it's a separate chapter, or something about how that is handled. And it's addressed just as much as setback, the quantitative things. So maybe that is a step that I wasn't aware that the city has no place to put that, but certainly as a city we should look at that going forward. But back to the plan, that is the intent. There was clear non-support for any give to get leverage strategy. And I think that was because the sense was the expectation of the plan is clear. It is up to the city and the planning commission to decide how to administer it. If there is this request for flexibility language, then again, I would say rec let's recommend that be included in the comp plan to give an out. So that if, if the fear is about having to go back to Met Council for a comp plan amendment, let's address it there. But for this work plan, I don't think there's any interest in leaving it at two stories and 24 feet. Because every proposal then will now require a rezoning. And that's not our intent, to have all these plans come every single one before the Planning Commission and the City Council. That's just too intensive. There's an opportunity here to actually zone and design for what you want, and I think this is what the work group is recommending. I think the way, the way we looked at it in the 44th and France group is that when you lay it out on the front end, and you can call it give to get, you can call it leverage, it's very explicit what we'd be looking for if the developers want to do something other than what's in the zoning. When it's incorporated in here, I think it's going to be really hard for the Planning Commission to, to see a proposal and then kind of look through all of this and say, oh, wait a minute, we're, there, we're supposed to add this and this. It isn't quite as explicit. I don't think it's really that different. It's just incorporated in this. I don't see any way that the city is going to codify. I mean, you can't codify that you're going to put in a woo nerf because you haven't seen the design yet. You don't know what the developer is going to come forward with. So there's no way you can say, we want to do this or we won't do it unless we get this or that. I mean, you have to have a whole list of things that you might trade off that you can use as leverage. But there's no way you can codify that. I just jumping in a little bit actually. I think that we're we've all kind of a, we're all kind of establishing the same points back and forth at this point. So I think it gets down to whether we accept the height in here or if somebody wants to propose a change and then we should just vote on that. Cuz I and I, I don't know I see the chair shake, shaking your head in agreement, Motion. nodding in agreement. Yeah, excuse me, nodding in agreement. So I think we've established if anyone has any new. Uh, I don't mean to jump in on you, and, and I think that you're right. I think we've gone round and round about this, but it seems like we've got several pieces that are still at loose ends. We've got the XL piece in the road. We've got the connection of the bikeway to Bush Lake. Um, we've got the height and density that we've danced with for quite some time now. Um, um, What else is there? My suggestion was, my suggestion would be that we, we wait to, we need to have that language organized in a way that we can actually vote on it. Um, and it's, it's too late for me and I don't have our brain cells left to do that. Um, I, would, I would like to see it come back to us in an organized sort of way. So I would suggest that we delay it for approval 
um, at this time. Um, and so that would be my motion. So, is there discussion? I think I'm, I'd need some clarification yeah, as to what, because what's the, coming back. The, there is the language. I hope everyone received the, the staff memo that had the, the language. Is there something different that you're looking for? Uh, it seemed like the language is in, it, it, as we went down the table um, three times, it, it seemed like there were some issues there that folks weren't that some folks were quite comfortable with and others not. Um, so I, I suppose we can put that to a vote and simply test it as it sits, but it doesn't resolve the XL piece, it doesn't resolve the, the street across or the connection across to the industrial park, it doesn't resolve the bike path connection to... to uh, right, well, I just to add, since Bush we're Lake. in the comment, I think that those are pieces that could be carried forward, you know, to the city council, but that's just How will they be written up? Who will do that? How will that happen? Um, I think it will happen, but, okay. I mean, okay. Either way, it's getting late. I mean, I, there could be language added to those graphics that, that stated this is for illustrative purpose only, the intention here is to have some kind of a platform somewhere along the rail. Um, the east-west connection isn't necessarily specific to that location, but the idea is to provide east-west connections. So I, I think what John is recommending, though, is right now, there's, I guess there's two options. One is to submit this plan that's in front of us tonight with a bunch of notes for suggested changes to the city council. And the other option is to take another week or something and get a plan with every comment, you know, that we've all said, yeah, that's the plan we want to submit with, without a bunch of codicils and side notes. And I think that's what that's, you're suggesting. That's exactly where I am. And I think we have a motion and a second on the floor. So I think that's a good idea. Actually, I'd rather have one document myself. Uh, a motion, do you so? One more point of discussion, then it, it, we didn't discuss this memo, whether this memo, are we recommending that this memo move forward as an amendment to the document? Is that a second step? I, I would recommend that this get rewritten. Um, that would be my preference, to be written as a recommendation to include that language in the comp plan. So then the document would go ahead with assuming that we make those changes. And then this flexibility leverage would be passed on as a recommendation to the council to consider adding that as an a, a, a men, a, a amendment to the comp plan or incorporate into the comp okay. plan for the so update. So do you accept that amendment? I'm going, I'm kind of tired too. I think we just have the motion to, See you to table and bring up to the next meeting. I don't think it's my belief is that when okay. it comes back, it's simply a vote. It isn't a public hearing on the vote. Right. It's here's the document, accept it, reject it, move it to council. All right, so, so it's not a second a public hearing? No, I should not. No, you've closed the we public closed hearing. Mm -hmm. So we had a motion and a second. Motion, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hey. I have no idea what to do. Nay. Nay. Motion carries. If, if I'm, I'm, so we're, we're, staff is not clear yeah. on the direction of what we're supposed to bring back. Is it? My, my belief what was, what was going to happen is that the work group chairs were going to sit down with you, grind out, work out that wording so that we're equal. We understand what we're getting. Bring it back to the next planning commission meeting and it will pass. Can I add one thing? I mean, there's been a variety of comments. You just provide, provide, provide a document that kind of reflects comment, the comments received tonight that you think should be reflect changes in the document and then circulate that, yes. right? Yes. Right. I don't I, think you need to go and no. sit. Yeah, that's not, I think. That's sort of rewriting. 
That's not what I was intending. No, I, I, I mean, I suggest either having alternative language, exactly what you have here as one option, which I personally support, a different one that perhaps other people support, and then just make you know, the, the general comments that these things will be addressed or tweaked in the, you know, before the, I don't know, proposal to the, the council. So I defer tonight then. That's kind of what we just said not to do. I mean, there, there are, there are may, may, maybe, maybe we should put a, a smaller group together, kind of review this and come up with a game plan instead of trying to figure out the game plan tonight right here. There are a variety of comments that we received tonight that we don't know how they're going to be handled. I mean, I, sure. I would be open to uh, accepting the comments that we've talked about. I think they're all very uh, helpful, and uh, I don't think I think there's some way we can um, incorporate that. So th those are changes to the document. I don't see that as as being uh, a difficult task or time consuming. What my concern is is the language in this addendum and what we've decided to do with it. We just talked about the plan. There was no reference to this addendum. This is a separate, separate document. So the addendum, you can either approve the plan with the addendum, meaning now those changes have to be incorporated. You can just accept the plan, not the addendum. So I'm not sure what we voted on, but if you are accepting, if we're accepting the plan with the addendum, then I have some suggestions for changes in language to the addendum. And just so we're clear, the addendum is basically saying that that the density's great, the density can increase if it's affordable housing. That's like the gist of the addendum, right? And, the and, and then there was the language. yeah, and, and more flexibility language with the with the affordable with the housing height. and then there was an, there was a counter to the amendment saying this doesn't belong in the small area plan this belongs in the broader right. the, the comp plan let's get that into the comp plan. but it also changes the length well, so, so this is so, the so comp you, you've plan. got two changes it's still I mean whether we move it out of this chapter and into the land use chapter it's still in the comprehensive plan we, again, we've talked about this. My council requires density minimums and maximums. Right. So we still have to have that. that language. Yeah, it will. It will be in here. But I think that this flexibility language belongs in the comp plan. Your number two. So. I, I, just want, I just want to be on record. I, I, think the, I think this discussion about the height is a very important one, but I also think there are a variety of other changes in here that we've discussed tonight. And I, I just want to be on record that I don't like the idea of approving a document knowing that it's going to be changed. I've seen mistakes happen with that recently. Carrie, in fact, I know I, I made comments about something that we had discussed in here, and nobody said, oh, we'll change that, but it got to the city manager, and he interpreted it completely opposite of how we intended it to be. And that's what happens when you approve a document knowing changes are going to be happen made on its way to city council. And so I would recommend that we don't approve a document that we think doesn't think has the language that we think is appropriate. Because otherwise mistakes are going to happen and then it's a 10 year plan. So are you recommending that we do amend the plan and not, not have an addendum? Yeah, I, I think we should, we should clean up this plan. And then I think if there's one issue left, which is the height and density, I think then we have a, a straight up or down vote on you, know, you and Susan and Jerry and whoever else can participate in a discussion about uh, language that could be made. And then we could have a straight up and down vote on whether, that, whether the language in the document is what we like or the language in the alternative one is what we like. We already approved a table. It's been it's been tabled. I just don't want Carrie to feel like you have to get in a room with Susan and Jerry and the group and fight it out. So just I think what was just proposed is come back with some of the edits to this, and then with this other version, and then we'll have that vote. 
so, right. I don't think we're looking. For, we're not looking for on the addendum issue compromise language. I mean, I think we just want. If I'm a, this is the plan. This is what the the. The, the small board group has this is staff's comments and what they would recommend and we so you're not looking to have an addendum I, I think once we get onto one issue we can vote yay or nay on See, this is yes. where I'm, staff will, I'm, we're so, having a hard time so, here because we're getting different no, we, we can get, let me let me guess the summary too so we have a bunch of little things in the actual plan document that we want to change Commissioner Hamilton brought up three things that's like for Commissioner Lee and Jerry right. to address, and we can provide our comments in the next week or two. Separately for staff, still have this stuff separately, and then we vote on that up or down next time. I don't, I don't see you doing anything else besides this. It's either a yay or nay at this point. Okay, okay so, so Jerry and Susan are working on the draft plan, making edits. And staff is working on the addendum. Well, one thing, though, is that, as Su Susan said that she might have some comments to this addendum. I would like, I, I would like her, her the opportunity to review those with Carrie. They are. She already did. I mean, if she, you know. No, I, I, say, I say it's to us now. No. Yeah, I I would like to if if Carrie's open to it, working on this document to see what we can come back because right now it says insert you know, on page 36, page, th that's specific to this report. That's where I object. To me, it's not so much this, this process that you were trying to uh, save or retain, but it should not affect this, this document. It, it should live in the comp plan. So if we can identify a spot for it in the land use chapter, or maybe it's under affordable housing, and incorporate it there, that might be what this memo ends up being so, about. So, uh, yeah, th that's a good point. But I'll tell you that that's not how the, a lot of people on the dais tonight want to go. And so the, the, the thing is, to just, you can make that point, but people are going to vote on whether to include this in this amendment, amended language in this. Okay. You, you've made that point very clear, and it's a, it's a good point. But that's, you know, I think there's a lot of people want to do it differently, and that's what we need to decide. Do we vote for the way you're suggesting it or the way other people are suggesting it? And that's what we have to come to a head on. Yes. So, do we think we can do this in two weeks, or do we, should we put a so we'll have it on the next agenda? Okay. Great. Moving on. Um, I've lost my agenda. I, I think. Reports and recommendations. Okay, and I think that guy from 50th and Fourth. Good. Um, okay, so next is uh, chair and member comments. Anything? Any staff comments? Nothing happening. What happened at council? So people know. We had nothing on the agenda at the last council meeting, so I wasn't even there. Wow. <laughs> I had a night off. Okay, sweet. Yeah, so at their upcoming meeting, they have several items from the planning. They have the 7200, uh, 7250. Uh, well, we won't have this on their next agenda, which we were planning. The solar ordinance will be before them next week. And oh, the, 40, the 4532 France project will also be before mm -hmm. them. Okay. So I'll have a lot to report on that year at our next okay. meeting. Okay, next time. Okay. This was scheduled for a public hearing, so yes, it will show up on their agenda, but we'll have to postpone that public hearing until we are finished. Okay. All right. Has a recommendation? Motion. Motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, aye. Thank you.